What's your worst story from the throw him in the pool, he'll learn how to swim parenting style? Two days after I graduated high school, I came home to an empty house. All my stuff in a U-Haul because my mom and stepdad moved without me. I've been financially independent ever since, but a heads up would have been nice. Edit. I woke up so grateful for all the love this post is getting. To make some clarifications, my real dad was not involved in this situation. He was on the other side of the country. I'm still close with him, but he's very low income, so he could not help me in this. I went no contact with my mom for about a year, but she weaseled her way back in. I think I see her in person once every two years, and I do not acknowledge my stepfather exists. I've been considering going no contact with my mom again recently. Story 2. This actual thing. I was a lifeguard as a high schooler. Some parent did this to their 5-year-old. Parent thought the kid was fine because he wasn't splashing around. He was bobbing up and down with his arms going straight up and straight out. That actually means they're drowning. Had to jump in and grab the kid, who had swallowed significant amounts of water, and call an ambulance to check the kid out. Parent didn't want us to call the ambulance, but we told him it was the ambulance or the police because what he did could be considered child endangerment. Dad was losing his crap, screaming at me, a 17-year-old girl. Owner of the pool saw this, and he, former Navy dude, got up in the guy's face. Parent was banned from the pool for life. To this day, I'm convinced the guy was completely hammered. Story 3. I actually used to be a swim teacher in college, teaching private lessons in people's backyards, because of parents who had thrown their kids into the pool to sink or swim. It was usually moms calling for me to help because they heard from a friend of a friend that I was able to teach their kid and get them to like the water again in about a month or less. One kid, he was seven, I had to sit with him on the pool deck the whole first lesson and bring buckets of water to him. His dad had dunked him multiple times and insisted that his son would just figure it out eventually because, quote, that's how he learned. Needless to say, he was never home when I was there. The mom had me come while dad was at work. Four weeks later, he had me come later in the afternoon so he would come home towards the end of the lesson. His dad saw his son swimming and cried happy tears. He had no idea I had been there three days a week for a month. My favorite student was a 70-year-old man who wanted to do a triathlon, but never learned to swim because his dad threw him in as a child. It took about three months total, a lot of hand-holding on the steps and shallow end, but he finally achieved his goal and I got to cheer him on at the finish line. I still remember how each of my students clung to my arms and clawed at my neck in their first lessons. I never dunked or forced anyone out of their comfort zone. My lessons had to be customized for each student to keep it fun and relaxing. The trauma in their eyes was haunting, though. It stayed with me, and I never force anything on my kids that they aren't ready to do. It's about trust, not force. Story 4. Just walk it off. My dad, when I developed a big nasty cyst on my toe when my mom was away on a stressful trip, she was not pleased to come back and have to immediately drive me to the hospital. It got to the point where I took one step on it and almost passed out. He apologized afterward, got a sandwich from a really good sandwich place, and I forgave him. Now I laugh about it. It was a Maria sub shop in Situate, Massachusetts, USA. It's really good. Also, I guess this is worth bringing up. My dad is the son of a man who attempted to walk off a gangrenous leg infection that very same year. R.I.P. Grandpa. Oh, I laugh about that, too. Story 5. Seven years old. Had an asthma attack at our camp in the middle of the night. At that time, treatment for an attack was a nebulizer machine that required electricity, which we didn't have at our camp. My parents kept telling me that I just had to calm down and breathe better so the attack would go away on its own. They only intervened hours later because they couldn't sleep because of all the noise I was making as I choked and gasped for air. We drove three hours back to our house, passing multiple hospitals along the way because they were embarrassed that I was in such bad shape and blamed me for just not breathing properly. Fun times. ETA, I've been trying to reply to everyone's questions, but there's a lot of them, so I'll just answer the most common ones here. I still have asthma, but it has been well managed for years now. I take Zenhale every day and Ventolin as needed. I've been no contact with my mother for over a decade. She's a narcissist who not only emotionally abused me, but encouraged my older brother to do so as well. This led to him physically and essaying me. And when I eventually confronted her on this, she said it was my fault for, quote, being such a female dog. I cut her out of my life, and that's made a world of difference for my mental health. Obviously, no contact with brother either. I'm still in contact with my father. They divorced in my early 20s. We aren't close, but I still find enough value in the relationship to keep talking to him. He isn't actively cruel like my mother was, just lost in his own world, I guess you could say. I feel sorry for him that he hasn't managed to overcome his own demons the way that I have. Overall, I'm happy and healthy now. 
I have a lovely husband, and we've created a good life for ourselves. I do have CPTSD from the years of abuse I lived through, but therapy and proper medication have helped tremendously. Story 6. Not my dad, but my mom's friend thought I was faking a fear of water and inability to swim. When I was three to four, I was learning to doggy paddle pretty well and would paddle off the stairs of my grandma's apartment complex pool. Do a little loop and come back. Well, I miscalculated, missed the stairs once and went under for several seconds. My older sister, 10 at the time, was able to pull me out. Grandma had hip surgery, so was unlikely to get a rescue from her. After that, I was pretty much done with swimming. Like, I'd get in the water only if I could touch the bottom. Fast forward a year or so, and this woman says, Oh, I can teach him to swim, which really meant yelling at me to just swim and quit being a baby. Eventually, to prove I was lying, she threw me in the deep end of her pool. I sank. Guess who pulled me out? My sister. The effing woman would have watched me drown to prove a point. I don't think my mom continued to keep her as a friend when she found out. I never saw her again. I'm a relatively strong swimmer nowadays, have my advanced open water dive cert, and I'm pretty self-sufficient at not drowning. Yeah, that's like the ultimate middle finger to the would-be traumatizers. It's like, okay, you want to try to make me afraid of water and fear of drowning? Well, guess what? I'm going to get a deep open water advanced certification, and I'm just going to scuba dive and go deep into the water just for the hell of it. I love it. I love it. Way to clap back. Story 7. My mom's whole parenting style was sink or swim, but funny enough, it's when my mom tossed me in the pool. The summer between first and second grade, my family moved somewhere with a pool. My mom was adamant that I had learned to swim as a baby, so she brought floaties for my younger sister and refused to buy any for me because I already knew how to swim and was too big for floaties. When I refused to get into any part of the pool I couldn't walk in, my mom called me from the outside of the pool and promptly grabbed me and tossed me into the six-foot end. And surprise, I didn't know how to swim. I remember splashing twice, hearing my mom yell at me to stop panicking. Then I went under and tried swimming to the surface like I'd seen in the movies and eventually got my head a bit above water, coughed out a bunch of water and started screaming for help before I went under again. My mom told me to stop making a scene and swim towards the edge. I made it to the edge and couldn't pull myself out of the pool, so my mom yelled at me to swim to the shallow end. When I tried to grab onto the edge to just pull myself to the shallow ends, my mom kept taking my fingers off the edge and yelling for me to stop playing and just swim. When I finally got to the shallow part, my mom and family went, See? You still remember how to swim. You never forget. Story 8. My dad bought a new house after my parents divorced. Behind us were two kids close in age. Nine to ten, I think. With me that used to F with me every time I visited. One day, they hopped my dad's fence, pushed me down, and stole my basketball. When I told my dad, he decided to go talk to their parents to get my ball back. Oh, wait, that's what normal dads would do. My dad, a former pro boxer, made me fist fight both of them one at a time and earn my basketball back. Edit. Wow, lots of questions. I'll try to answer them all. 1. Yes, I had training before that incident. Learning how to fight was non-negotiable to him. He had me learning how to fight before I even started school. I was threatened with punishment if I allowed myself to be bullied. I fought professionally for a while, but retired in my 20s. 2. I fought them both one at a time. I definitely won against the first kid, but by the time I fought the second, I was exhausted and he was not. In the MMA slash combat sports world, we called that the shark tank. It's brutal. I was tired in the second fight, so it didn't go as well. If it were a sanctioned fight, it would have definitely been a draw. 3. Sadly, growing up with a redneck dad means that I have a tiny redneck living in my brain that not only doesn't fear conflict, but embraces it. If someone hurts my family, wife, or friends, I become the avatar of toxic masculinity. I'm in therapy dealing with it, and I've had a couple of relapses. Most recently against my wife's co-worker harassing her and me deciding to threaten him at a company Christmas party. Not proud of that, lol. Story 9. My mom forced me to drink milk, and she thought I just hated healthy stuff and only preferred junk food. The thing is, I always loved veggies, but I also liked junk food. Basically, I love food, except for milk. I just couldn't consume milk. It'd make me vomit, and then I'd have sudden acid reflux and not being able to handle it. She thought I was acting to escape, but I just hated it. Turns out I'm lactose intolerant, and my mom still thinks I'm making that up just because she can't let go of her ego. 
Story 10. When I was about five or six, I was very sick with the flu. Fever, vomiting, sweating, congestion. It was awful. There was some mix-up at the pharmacy, and they thought I was my father and gave him adult medication. Basically, these giant horse pills. Now, normal child medication for things like this are syrups and chewable crap for obvious reasons. My dad comes home and tells me I have to take these meds. I have a hard time getting them down, almost choking a few times. My dad got frustrated and literally started shoving these huge pills down my sore throat with his angrily shaking fingers. I started crying. My nose was stuffed, so I could only breathe through my mouth. I remember my dad's wedding ring banging against my teeth, eyes watering, gasping for air while looking at my mom for help. Eventually, I coughed it back up, crying and throat on fire. I remember my mom demanding an apology from my dad, who just said, Well, he's going to have to learn to take pills like that sometime anyway, and stormed off. Damn, I haven't thought about that story in 20 plus years. Story 11. I was volunteering at a parent-child zoo day, and saw a few parents like this. The zoo had some free-roaming peacocks, and it was awful how many parents just didn't tell their too young to know kids that they can be mean. So the little toddler goes, wow, pretty bird, and tries to get a closer look, only to get chased and attacked by this thing while the parents watch. Most of them said something like, you should have known better. Like, how if you never teach them? The child can barely walk. You expect them to remember that some animals have a strong territorial sense? And then your baby gets terrorized by this thing that's bigger than them and looks like an alien for all they know, and you don't even give them a hug? See, also, that one mom we had to kick out of the zoo because she was encouraging her kids to antagonize the llama in the hopes it would spit on them. Yikes, people. Have some empathy for tiny humans who trust you implicitly with their well-being. Okay, I feel like this OOP was kind of spying on me as a child because I personally had the exact same experience with a peacock at the zoo. You know, its, it's tail feathers were down and I went up to get close to it, get a closer look, and territorial peacock all of a sudden like spreads out its tail and like starts fanning at me with its tail feathers and I freaked the F out. I tried to book it out of there and my mom grabs me by the collar and throws me back towards the birds like no don't be scared of it it's just a peacock it's a bird it can't hurt you and that still is like burned into my subconscious to this day I am still terrified of peacocks and really large birds in general because my mother made me like get all up on it like that when I didn't want to it's crazy how that kind of stuff sticks with you story 12 that basically describes exactly how my parents would teach me anything it wasn't really teaching at all. It was showing me once super quickly, then expecting me to fully grasp the concept because I was supposed to absorb that knowledge from observation alone, apparently. And when I wouldn't get it on the first time, I would be berated or beat. When I was six, my parents tried to teach me how to tie my shoes. They showed me super quick once, fast enough that I couldn't process what was happening, then told me to do it. I didn't understand, and so they started yelling at me, telling me how I shouldn't even wear shoes because I was so stupid. I didn't learn how to properly tie my shoes until I was 18, and I had to teach myself. I still use the bunny ears method. The worst part of that was that people would make fun of me for not knowing how, and I couldn't explain the situation at home because they would have just thought that I was making excuses. Where I live, we have bags of milk. We have a pitcher where we place the bags, and I usually tie an elastic band around the corner that I snip open. One summer, when I was five or six, I woke up bright and early because my brother was in summer school, so I'd have the whole morning to myself. I went to make a bowl of cereal, and when it was time to put the milk back, my mom tried to teach me how to tie the elastic band to the bag. I did it, but she had told me it was wrong, and so beat me and told me to do it again. For the entire morning, she would tell me that I was doing it wrong and beat me. By the time I had my cereal, it was noon and my brother had already come home. I didn't even think I was doing it wrong because I've been doing it the same way since then. I'm pretty sure my mom wanted an excuse to beat me. Story 13. My dad and I once witnessed someone who literally did this for a little three-year-old girl. This little girl was just playing at the edge of the pool, happily minding her own business, when her dad ran up behind her, picked her up, and tossed her screaming as far as he could into the deep end of the pool while yelling, Time to swim, honey! At first, my dad and I didn't react, because my dad has done this to me as a game. I learned to swim first. But we started to notice that she was struggling to surface while the dad just watched. My dad nervously asked, can she swim? To which the guy just shrugs and says, she'll figure it out. 
I've never seen my dad book it so fast to get in the water as I did that day. He quickly got the kid out of the water and started screaming at the guy about what kind of idiot he was while the girl was just bawling her eyes out. I swear my dad was ready to deck the guy. This was back in the 1990s, so we didn't have a cell phone to call the police, but we never saw them again after. It was the first time in my life I had seen insane parenting, and to this day freaks me out that some people will still do this. Story 14. This kind of counts. I was a kid who was always zoned out or stared into space, which resulted in a lot of adults, including teachers and my parents, thinking I was deliberately ignoring them. They tried everything. It's like I wouldn't even hear them when they yelled. Then I acted like I didn't even know what they were yelling at me for. What a little a-hole, right? I was such a little idiot. I'd stop mid-sentence, zone out for sometimes even up to or past a minute, then pick up my sentence right where I left off. Sometimes I would stop walking for no reason. It could take me upwards of hours to finish a page of maths homework. I was so slow that what took classmates five minutes to do could take me all of a lesson. My mom would tell me things, only for me to later insist she has never said that. She would call for me, and I wouldn't answer, until she had to yell, at which point I would turn around and insist she didn't have to shout. In the end, it was always the same. A teacher would decide that if I didn't want to give them respect, I could just do things alone. I should have listened to them while they were explaining things if I was really interested in learning, right? So they stopped helping me when I didn't understand something they had already said, because I should have been listening in the first place. Surely this would get the message across, right? After all, this bratty little kid has to learn to listen. Well, as a result of stress, I had a grand mal seizure. I was taken to hospital where I was diagnosed with absence epilepsy, a form of epilepsy that doesn't have the tremors associated with typical seizures. A person having an absent seizure simply stares, having a completely still seizure with their eyes open. As a result of this, it often looks like someone is simply staring out into space, unresponsive or ignoring you, when they may actually be having a medical emergency. So, during times when I would be ignoring a teacher, I was actually having an absent seizure. Suddenly, they would be yelling at me and I honestly didn't know why. Now I have to pay for seizure medication and therapy. I'm realizing that this is a lot of people's first time hearing about absence epilepsy. My experience of it is a little atypical. I would have seizures anywhere from a few seconds to a couple minutes long. I would have hundreds a day, and they persist into adulthood. Here's a page with more information on it, including bite-sized information on what to look out for. By knowing the signs of absence epilepsy, you might save someone years of pain, and perhaps even worsening symptoms. It would mean so much to me if you could glance over it. You might realize it fits your little cousin, niece, nephew, etc. You could be the hero that I never got to have. So in addition to wanting to kind of double down and raise awareness about this, this is honestly the first time that I've heard about absence epilepsy, but I actually went to junior high school or middle school, if you want to call it that, with a kid that would always do this in our algebra class. He would, you know, we would kind of just say like, look, you know, Liam's sleeping with his eyes open. And he would have his head resting on his desk, but like his face would still be up facing the front of the classroom and his eyes would be wide open and he wouldn't blink. And it literally looked like he was asleep with his eyes open. So based off of what this poster just described of absence epilepsy, it sounds very likely that uh, that my old classmate had to deal with this as well. So, yeah, definitely uh, check that out. Look into it. Raise awareness because that's. Obviously, now we know a serious medical condition and uh, needs to be addressed. Story 15. My dad was notorious for the rub dirt on it method when I got hurt as a kid. When I was nine, I was in a nasty motorcycle accident out in the desert. I broke and misplaced my fibula. The bone was protruding from my leg. My dad didn't want to end his desert trip early, so he told me not to look at it and to keep trying to walk. I was in so much pain, any time I would move, I would black out. My brother was so concerned, he urged my dad that we should go home. My dad finally gave in, but was so drunk, he let my 11-year-old brother at the time drive us out of the desert. He was so nervous, he hit so many bumps, and each bump I would black out, then come to. Once we got home, he thought it would be best to sleep it off before going to the hospital. The next day, I was admitted to the hospital, and my dad was taken into custody by CPS. What the hell, man? Seriously, what the hell? You need to have your children taken away from you. If you're going to A, let a nine-year-old ride a motorcycle, and B, when he breaks his leg and has the bone protruding through the skin, and you think, ah, oh, just rub some dirt on it, it'll be okay. Are you out of your mind? 
You have no right to parent and no right to ever reproduce ever again. Shame on you. You suck. Story 16. Parents just threw me into life. We never talked about anything. Zero. Zip. Nada. Was raised rather feral, meaning I could play outside and do whatever I wanted to, really, as most older folks were raised. Thing is, when I started to get into my teen years, it was my aunt that bought my first bra. Parents just didn't care. Got a call on the phone. It was the wrong number, but I talked to the guy for a while, and he offered to come over and pick me up. I was 14. My parents let me. His name was Wayne. I had a BF in high school who worked the night shift. He'd pick me up when he got off at around 2.30 a.m. My dad also worked nights, saw me up and waiting, asked where I was going. I said, out, just like he always did to my mom. He didn't say anything. I was 16. Got a job and paid rent from age 17 until 19 when I got my own place. Parents never helped me with crap. Oh, wait, they did get me cosmetic reconstructive surgery when I was around 22 to fix a different surgery I had for pectus excavatum, bent in chest, that I was born with. But my parents never fixed it until my heart and lungs were compressed as I grew. After the reconstructive surgery consultation, my dad turned to me and said, Don't ever ask me for effing thing ever again. Lovely childhood. No wonder I was a crack addict for 15 years. Story 17. I don't know if it fits the question, but once my family were visiting a temple and I was in my pre-teens. The temple was quite famous for the monkeys and were advised not to interact with them, mostly because they would steal stuff from your hands. We had finished our visit and returning back where we saw a dozen of the monkeys just minding their business. My dad somehow got this idea of greeting one of the monkeys. He said hello cheerfully to one of them and oh boy... He got pissed. My dad had walked away before the monkey could lunge at him, and the angry monkey looked at me, who was a bit behind my family members. I got scared and walked slowly, but the monkey started screaming at me, and suddenly two more joined in the screaming. I was half crying and half panicking as they literally ambushed me in the corner of the road. My parents then nonchalantly said to just walk away from there when they could see three big monkeys obstructing any way of escape. I just covered my head and prayed anyone to help me while my parents calmly looked at me as if waiting for me to come out of it without a scratch. Fortunately, a stranger who was just passing by saw me and shooed away the monkeys. They ran away and I ran towards my family. The whole trip they made fun of me and even criticized me as to how I could not just walk away from the monkeys. I was so pissed at my whole family, but they made it seem like I should have known better to save myself. Story 18. My stepdad was fairly open about hating me and my brother, his non-kids, and went out of his way as to not spend time with us. So almost everything he ever had to teach me was sink or swim because he was pissed he had to engage with me. He was incredibly athletic, hyper-masculine, conservative Christian, and I was a twig-thin, obviously queer bookworm of a kid. My mom tried to get him to do sports with me so I would get motivated to be more athletic. It lasted maybe 10 minutes before the neighbors called the cops on him and someone came out to stop what he was doing, resulting in a fistfight. Basically, he was pelting footballs at me as hard as he could because his philosophy was that I would either learn to catch them or keep getting hurt. Story 19. I got stung by a bee and my mother was convinced I was faking. At the point I started to struggle to breathe, she finally irritatingly relented and made me walk to the hospital, pushing my baby brother's stroller the entire way. When I got there, the staff was mortified, or horrified, sometimes mortified apparently, rushed me in to give me an epinephrine shot, and luckily that did the trick. Many months later, a bee got into my bedroom, and my father called me a coward for coming and getting him to deal with it, instead of dealing with it myself. You'll have to learn how to deal with these things sometime. Or, like, you know, I could just ask someone not allergic to bees to come and safely deal with the bee instead of risking hospitalization? Edit. Just to address some stuff I'm getting in comments. I agree my parents were terrible and abusive for more than just this one single incident. I've been NC for about 20 years because of the way they treated me as a child. I have countless incidents like this from both of them. This one just stood out at the time I was replying to this. Story 20. I got pregnant at 13. Mom allowed her new hubby to take me for the abortion, then he beat my ass when I got home from the procedure. She never asked who, what, or how. I'd been essayed since I was four to five, and somewhere in my stupid brain, I guess I thought that sex was love. When I got pregnant again at 14, I was made to keep the baby to, quote, teach me a lesson. Again, no one asked. No one tried to educate me. Finally, at 25, my mom pissed me off with her cluelessness, and in a fit of rage, I blurted examples of all the years of essay I endured, and she said, All these years, I thought Robert had been messing with you, and that was the reason you were acting out. 
You guys, when I tell you that my head exploded at the same time all the air left my body, I was stunned. One, she thought her now ex-husband had been essaying me, impregnated me not once, but twice, yet you never asked me. For clarity, it was never my stepdad. Two, your desire to be married to a serial cheater was far more important than my total health. She divorced him when I was 23 because she finally caught him with his best friend's wife. That was simply too much for her to handle. Three, this explains why she shipped my daughter and I off to my grandparents three months after her birth. Four, my mom has always had an unnaturally close relationship with my oldest daughter. This conversation revealed why. For 12 years, my mom thought my daughter was fathered by her husband. Anyway, I finally learned about sex education slash birth control from my 11th grade PE teacher. She saw my miserable self and did her best to mother and educate me at every opportunity. Story 21. This didn't happen to me, but to my older brother, so I had a front row seat to all of it. He was looking to purchase a house for cheap that was in a semi-rural area and wanted at least some acreage near it. His budget was way smaller than it should have been for the houses he wanted, and was looking at the most dilapidated, terrible houses ever. He found one that was just what he wanted. Multiple rooms, a basement, two acres of woods, and about 15 to 30 minutes away from nearby cities. It was only about $120,000, and he was sold on it. The problems were abundant, however, and I told him not to do it. Our parents loved this idea. They pushed and encouraged him, looked at it and took pictures, helped fill out loan paperwork, and even started planning all of the restoration projects it would need. My brother was committed all the way to the point of confirming the loan and moving there immediately. I was mortified. This house was an absolute dump made in the early 1910s and redid once in 1950. It had mold, holes in the roof and walls, old rusted wiring, peeling wallpaper, and crumbling shelves. The only redeemable part was the size of the rooms, which were pretty decent. I begged him to not do it, and it finally made him think twice. Finally, he relented and listened to me. He stopped and decided to not do anything. Later, I brought up how bad of an idea that house was, and my parents completely agreed. They thought it was garbage, but they wanted him to follow through because it would have been a good learning experience. I was floored and asked why they would support this then, and they simply responded that it would teach him to be careful with these kinds of things. They were literally going to let him go into massive debt and struggle so hard in order to teach him to be more careful of opportunities, and they tried to push it and encourage it instead of just sitting down and explaining all of this. Story 22. My dad, when he decided to give me driving lessons when I was a teenager, which turned out to be a driving lesson, singular, he took me to the parking lot across the street from our house and had me tool around to get used to the steering and pedals for about 15 minutes. Then, annoyed that I wasn't catching on fast enough for his taste, he decided we should go on the actual road and I'd learn faster in a more challenging environment. Cue him barking orders to quote, speed up, slow down, hit the brakes, in an increasingly frustrated voice as I tooled along, terrified I was going to hit someone. The culmination of our lesson came when he noticed we were low on gas and told me to pull into the gas station. Keep in mind, my sum total of driving experience at this point was about 25 minutes, which did not include parallel parking. I pulled into the gas station and came at the pump at something like a 30 degree angle. He grabbed the steering wheel to correct and actually yelled at me. Jesus Christ, don't you know how to drive? To which I said, no, I don't. You're teaching me, remember? He drove back home silently. That was the end of dad's driving lessons. I signed up with the driving school after that. Story 23. Three lessons for travel. First, as a kid, we went on vacation. My dad left me some money, left early in the morning with a note. It was up to me to figure out how to pack my stuff, get checked out of the hotel, make it to the airport, navigate the airport, figure out flights back home, and get on them. I was six, and this was in the 80s. Second, we had another vacation. I was told I needed to navigate some highways. On the drive back, we flew there, renting a car to drive back. Dad pulls over in the middle of the desert. My stepmom is there. He puts the keys to the ignition in a small safe, gets in the car with my stepmom, and drives off. Tells me that in a few minutes, he'll send a number on the pager with the combination to the safe. In it is gas money, paper maps, and the keys. It's up to me to get home. I was 16 and had just gotten my license. 
Third, another driving story that happened a few months after this. Middle of winter, a convention I wanted to go to. Had never done any real driving in bad conditions before. Had to drive over the Rockies and Sierra Nevadas in blizzards with heavy traffic. By myself. Had no idea how to even put the chains on or determine if I did it right, other than if I kept traction on the road. Story 25. I have a friend who was raised like this, and his parents kicked him out at 18 with no money, no help, nothing. He's no contact with them and has his life together now, but it took a long time for him to get his footing in the adult world. He had to really scrimp, save, and hustle to get his associate's degree and find a job. And although he's got a good job and a house now, he can't really turn off the hustle mode and relax. He's in the mindset of, I never got help and turned out fine. Every man for himself. He'll do favors for friends and he's an all-around good dude, but we disagree on a lot of political policies because of this. He thinks we shouldn't have to pay taxes and that social programs like free health care and student loan forgiveness are a joke, whereas I'm the complete opposite. It's kind of sad to see someone so angered by the thought of other people finally getting the help that should have existed back when he needed it. Story 26. My dad literally threw me in the pool. I remember it so strongly. I was five. We evacuated our house because a hurricane was coming. Our family was at a hotel 150 miles away from home. I remember being scared because I didn't know what was going to happen to our home. My older brothers were swimming in the pool. I was sitting on the edge of the pool with my feet in the water. My dad comes up behind me and scoops me up and swings me around, pretending to throw me in. At first, I'm laughing even though deep down I'm scared. Then, before I know it, I'm mid-air. He threw me into the middle of the pool. I don't remember what happened next, but my brother said I sank to the bottom like a rock and they had to get me. I remember coming to on the concrete of the pool with chlorine water coming out of my nose. I started crying and my mom was yelling at my dad. We went upstairs to the hotel room where I was hiccuping and coughing up water. I remember vividly burping and chlorine water coming up. To this day, the scent of chlorine water makes me nauseous. I'm 30 and I still don't know how to swim. I took lessons over a full summer as a middle schooler, but I was so bad that they had to put me in the class with the five-year-olds who were still better than me. If I ever snap and go postal, you know where the buried trauma came from. I still sank like a rock and still don't know how to swim. Story 27. My own story with my parents. Cuban parents who moved to Miami and had me after 10 years or so. Only ever cooked Cuban food. Said I'd learn how to eat and enjoy it. Force-fed me black beans while standing against a wall, and I'd almost always throw it back up on them. We never ate together as a family. Dad would eat in the living room, Mom in her room, and me in mine. I would take a few bites, wrap the rest in paper towels, and stuff them in the bottom of a drawer, and take my almost empty plate to the kitchen. Would tiptoe to the kitchen after midnight to throw the paper-wrapped food away. Eventually, in high school, I messed up and forgot a few, and Mom found them. Then, all of a sudden, she'd offer to make me something I'd actually eat. I was always underweight growing up and would put metal marbles and magnets in my pockets to fool the scale at the pediatrician's office. I would eat as much as I could at school and my friends knew to give me whatever they wouldn't eat for lunch. Don't starve your kids to prove a point. Story 28. The first thing I can think of was when I was seven and my mom signed me up for weekly swimming classes. I was terrified of water and I did not want to go with them, but I didn't have a choice. When I got to the first lesson, she told two of the instructors, two big burly men, that she wanted them to carry me into the pool and just keep me there. She warned them that I would freak out, kick, punch, scream, and try to escape. But if they just held my arms and legs, I would eventually stop. And that is what they did. I learned to be in the water, but I did not manage to learn how to swim on this course. I absolutely hated it. The best time of the week was right after the lessons were over and we were on our way home in the car, because at this point the next lesson was as far away as possible. I still have a strong dislike for pools and swimming, and I'm still afraid of water where I can't reach the bottom with my heels and have my head above the surface at the same time. This and other things contributed to low self-esteem and confidence issues. As I got older, I started thinking that to not be seen as a wuss, I had to dive headfirst into things completely fearless, like idiotic off-road biking stunts and skateboarding as fast as gravity would allow it on a public road with traffic. It sometimes gave me problems. When I was 14, I was visiting a friend that had bought snow skis for his kick bikes. We started racing them down a long, steep field, and we got the idiotic idea that we should build a jump at the bottom. And I, of course, did not want to be seen as the weakling who chickened out of everything and jumped at the chance to try it first. I blasted down the hill as fast as I could. 
I went much faster than any of us had ever gone before, hit the jump, and had a massive fall. The skis weren't designed for jumping and would just poke down into the snow when you landed no matter what you did. I landed on my wrist and at the very least sprained it, but I think I may have actually gotten a tiny fracture. My friends did not try the jump. A while later, my dad came to pick me up and drive me to an extracurricular activity. I told him that I couldn't go because of the accident. He felt sorry for me, understood completely, and took me home instead. Then my mom got annoyed because I didn't go to my practice session. I tried to tell her what had happened and that my wrist was in terrible pain, but she thought I was overreacting. Luckily, it was not my dominant hand that was affected, so I managed to get on mostly like normal. But I got criticized for not putting in enough effort at the extracurricular activity for a while. The wrist gave me trouble for more than six months, and it went on to give me problems several times over the years. I went through the exact same thing with a damaged tailbone a while later, and an undiagnosed back pain when I was 16. I got some remarks because I acted like an old man, and this couldn't possibly be that bad. I tried to tell her that something as simple as breathing made it hurt, and yawning felt awful, but it didn't get through. After this, I gradually stopped telling her about pains, ailments, and most other things that happened in my life. Story 29. Dad actually threw me into a pool and I couldn't and didn't swim back up. He did it twice. First time when I was about six or seven. I recall it happening pretty vividly. The second time, after he had disappeared and reappeared in our lives, I was about 12 or 13 this time. I haven't learned to swim. I'm terrified of the water. If I can't touch the floor, then I immediately go into a panic. I'm 30 years old now. Shamefully, cannot swim well enough to trust going into deep water. Worse now that I'm a father, and if my son was ever in trouble, my fear would make me fail in helping him. It's a constant nightmare that I think about. It's a recurring nightmare to wake up, sometimes feeling like I'm drowning. I've looked into swim lessons so many times, I keep making up excuses to avoid following through. At this point, I feel like I need to get help before I can learn to swim well enough to help anyone, ever. <sighs> deep breath. Story 30. When I was 12, my cousin, seven at the time, began living with us while his parents were still working on their visas for a few more months. With absolutely zero knowledge on how to take care of a kid half my age, let alone teaching experience, I was basically expected to teach him how to speak, understand, and read English so he doesn't end up like you did in elementary school. When I was six, I barely spoke English because my parents were first-generation Chinese immigrants. I was bullied a lot for my funny words while speaking broken English mixed with Mandarin. That was rough to say the least. Couldn't hang out with my friends because my folks said they were a bad influence. TBF, some were as they started doing underage smoking and drinking. Fortunately, my cousin was actually a really smart guy. Eventually, he got the hang of English, and now he's kind of like me. English is technically our secondary language, but we're far more fluent in it and out of practice with Mandarin. Now the guy's about to go into his senior year of college. Story 31. I was nine. I'd never had a puppy before, had no idea how to take care of one. Also had issues with things that were loud or messy. Had no idea I was getting a puppy. Woke up at 8 that morning. Mom had left for work at like 6 like she always did. Aunt was asleep in her room. Knocked out on Benadryl. She had slept through a 6 point earthquake like that. Went down to the kitchen and sitting in it was a golden retriever puppy. Who had rolled in her own crap and coated the entire kitchen in it. With a note from mom saying, surprise, take good care of her, she's your responsibility now. Now part of the problem may be that it turns out I was terribly sick. I had a 102 degree fever, but let me tell you that I have never hated anything more than I hated that dog that morning. Every time I had the mess cleaned up, she would make a new one. It really didn't get better from there. Mom being firmly of the opinion that I needed to train the dog myself, and that included learning how to train the dog myself. When my aunt moved back to New York, she took the puppy with her. She's much happier there. My uncle has a whole pack of big dogs, and a giant patch of land for them to sow chaos onto. I remain firmly a cat person. Story 32. A few years ago, I was wrestling in this JV, Junior Varsity, tournament. I had already had about four to five years of experience, and I was pretty well prepared. All went as I expected, and I won all of my matches except for one. The one match I lost was the one my parents volunteered me for. 
At the time, I weighed around 115 pounds and was 11 years old. My opponent was 132 pounds and 15 years old. In wrestling, this big of a weight and age difference doesn't usually happen, but it was one of the last matches of the day and couldn't count for anything, so nobody cared. My parents basically said, go get him, Tiger, and sent me to the scoring table. I get in the mat before him, and I was more or less shaking in fear. This dude had a full mustache and was around 6'1 to 6'2". When the match started, he picked me up, spun me around, and threw me down on the mat. Hard. I blacked out for a couple minutes and woke up to a trainer in my face asking me a bunch of questions. In the background, I saw the person I was wrestling laughing his ass off and my coach and mom cursing out my dad. I limped out of there with a severe headache and most likely a bruised tailbone. Needless to say, my dad stopped volunteering me to things without telling me after that. Story 33. This isn't about my parents, but about my teacher. I was 17 when this happened. Some backstory. I have severe-ish trauma and PTSD from it. Two failed attempts, depression, an eating disorder, etc. Mental problems, YK. I never talked to my parents about it, and I didn't want to at that point. However, I was talking to that teacher regularly, because he helped me a lot. Someday, I tell him I self-harm the night before, and he goes, You can either go to the ER yourself, or I'll call your parents. While I was still at school, I got a call from my mom asking what happened, even though my parents knew I self-harmed. Then, my dad and stepmom call me, asking me the same questions. I explain it again, but I'm just so tired of it. I was really not doing well. I didn't go home that day until it was pretty late, so I wouldn't have to talk to my mom. The next day at school, my teacher pulls me aside and tells me, we have to act or this could get out of hand. I was very depressed, but nowhere near wanting to self-unalive anymore, and I told him I wanted to wait a few more months till I turn 18, so I wouldn't have to talk to my parents about it. In his opinion, though, that couldn't be such a big deal. He said, well, I just threw you in the water. You'll learn how to swim. I stayed away from home and ignored him for the rest of the week. He tells my other teachers, who again tell my parents, who would only do as much as yell at me or guilt trip me because they couldn't understand it. They said I'd have to get admitted or I couldn't go to school anymore. I was at a psych ward for three months after that and never really went back to school because of corona, but it definitely wasn't good for my mental health and I didn't learn how to swim. I turned 18 at the ward, got released, moved out, and broke off contact with my parents. I'm 19 now, and that move my teachers made nearly drove me to attempt a third time. I'm doing a little better now, and I'm on a different school, but everything that's happened was so unfair and decided on behind my back. Even though I was 17 and cooperative, it would have only been four months. I usually wouldn't post this on subs like this, so I hope I don't get hate for posting my story. Look, this poster here, just want to give a hug and words of encouragement. That's honestly really depressing to read, but thank you for sharing your story, and I hope that going NC with your parents and anyone that tried to kind of push you against your will to do those things, um, I hope that your mental health improves, and just know that you got people cheering for you. Story 34. Slight twist on your question, but I feel it applies at least somewhat. Some friends of mine kept leaving their daughter with me while they worked out their issues. They should have never been together in the first place, much less been parents to an incredible little girl. Anyway, she would make regular visits to Uncle Joey's house for a couple hours while they hashed out whatever they needed to, which usually resulted in one party leaving to get high somewhere while the other came to pick up their daughter. Well, one summer, baby girl Cakeface that's what I started calling her, wanted to use the pool. I knew she didn't know how to swim, so I took it upon myself to get her little wrist floaties, swim trunks, and a suit with a built-in life jacket to teach her to swim and tread water. Literally within the month, I taught her to cannonball in, open her arms, and kick her legs to get to the top, and once she breaches the water, to paddle, 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 paddle to the nearest edge, climb out and do it all again. Proud uncle moment. Well, anyway, I hadn't told them she was learning to swim. Only that we went to the pool so she could splash around and be distracted for a couple of hours. Apparently, parents and baby girl Cakeface went to a pool party and gave everyone a heart attack when she said, Mommy, Daddy, look! and ran straight to the pool and cannonballed in. They told me people jumped in after her and she was so confused. 
They asked her who taught her to swim, and she snitched me out, lol. Turned into a conversation about how I had to keep her distracted from the awful environment they were putting her in. They got divorced less than a year after. Story 35. When it came time to seriously start thinking about college, my mom refused to help me with anything. Questions about financial aid, how we were going to afford tuition, how I should choose what school slash what major, college tours, applying for scholarships, the whole college application process, etc. were all met with anger and annoyance. My entire junior year and senior year, I spent hours after school in the library applying to scholarships. Even worse, I applied to those BS scholarships that just asked you to submit a few sentences or follow their Twitter because I didn't know any better. Then I get to college and I had no idea how to pick a class schedule or how to research majors. It wasn't until my junior year in college that I found out the school had a site that lists all the requirements for each major in the undergrad Gen ED requirements. It was difficult playing catch up and I ended up graduating with a major I absolutely hated just because I had happened to have already satisfied most of the core requirements already. I didn't want to start from scratch and end up having to take another year. Yeah, I don't talk to my mom now. Story 36. Both of my parents are immigrants and are fluent in English and Igbo. In fact, most of my relatives are bilingual. Back when I was a kid, my parents were really insistent that I needed to learn Igbo because it's part of the culture. But the problem is that in my formative years when I was actually learning language, my family primarily spoke to me in English, with a couple of Igbo words slash phrases occasionally mixed in. To date, the only Igbo I'm fluent in are those few words my parents said over and over to me when I was still young. Nowadays, my parents have changed their strategy to randomly speaking completely in Igbo to me at completely random moments, or randomly bringing up a word in Igbo and making me try to pronounce it, which I usually can't pronounce properly because I don't exactly have a West African accent. I can confidently say that after two years of this, not only do I still not know how to speak Igbo, but now the language in general is starting to get on my nerves. They don't quite seem to understand that just speaking to someone in a totally foreign language doesn't help someone learn it. Story 37. All this thread confirms for me is that my approach to parenting my three-year-old is gentle and just how I want to raise my kid. Having the capacity and compassion to realize when a task is beyond her skill level, but encouraging her to keep trying and showing her the ropes instills confidence. This builds trust and a bond that will hopefully continue into her teen years when she faces bigger obstacles that may require my support and guidance to help her navigate it. Yes, you can just leave your kid to figure it out on their own, but a lot of the time it creates resentment and trust issues, and parents who parent like this often wonder why their teen will not open up to them and come to them when facing challenges. At three, my daughter enjoys helping me with laundry, cooking, and cleaning. She eagerly tries new things and has very little fear. She knows I have her back and that I trust her to try new things, and she can count on me for guidance. I thank my time as a mental health nurse for this insight. Being a hard ass on your kid does not better prepare them for the world. The world is a tough place. Your kids need to know they have a safe place to land in tough situations, where they can find the support and knowledge to navigate tricky situations. Story 38 the second I turned 18, my bipolar stepmom made me move out. No diploma, no car, no driver's license. I had a full-time and part-time job. That's it. My rent was six fifty, and I was making about 800 a month. This toss in the pool was so my dad and her, a couple making 100 k plus a year, could live in an RV at her parents' place. My dad didn't like the idea, but I think it was due to his own life being chaotic for so long that it tired him out completely. He went along with it. I grew up in a single-parent household, so the standard of living wasn't all bad for me, but I burned out fast. I lived about four months like that before a mixture of exhaustion, depression, and loneliness made me try to end myself with alcohol. I'm not a big drinker, but that night I took down a bottle of Rumpelmints and three-fourths of a bottle of Jägermeister. I was so blasted by the time I polished off the Jäger that I thought the bottle of Rumpelmints would do it. Nope. Woke up the next morning feeling like death with my friends looking at me sleeping on the floor. They talked to me about what happened and left a while after. My stepmom came in and chewed my ass about an hour after they left. She said I gave up, that I couldn't hack it, that I didn't try hard enough. 
My older stepsister had been flourishing, with her driver's license and her car my parents co-signed for but refused to co-sign one for me, and her roommates that help her split the bills. Of course I effing failed. Of course I effing failed. I do my best to leave the past in the past, but there was a lot of crap that could have gone a whole lot different for me if they had helped me. I walked to and from work, soaked in dishwater, in the dead of a Midwestern winter, because my parents refused to help me. The second my money-stealing, shoplifting, disobedient, manipulative, and spoiled sister turned 16, they bought her a $3,800 car. I was driving a $500 car I paid for myself with an exhaust and fuel leak at that time. I needed help with money for repairs since they refused to put me on their insurance and I was paying $220 a month for liability. I have, and to this day, never gotten a ticket. I was largely forgotten about when my dad married her, and it couldn't have come at a worse time. Those were the years that I really needed a boost to get my life on track. I got my license when I was 20, first car when I was 21, and I'm 26 now with a wonderful girlfriend, awesome pets, a nice apartment, and an okay job. They say that pain builds character. It doesn't. It just hurts. Story 39. Not sure if this counts? My mom was talking to another mom about how I didn't get along with my stepdad. I was probably nine years old, and no one had any idea that I was a girl on the autism spectrum, and that it was why I was more awkward or more annoying than other kids. I was terrified of my stepdad because he abused me while my mom worked full time and he stayed at home. And this other mom, not really knowing anything about my situation, told my mom, let him beat her and she'll learn, according to my mom, who relayed the conversation to me years later. I don't know how my friend's mom could have even said that, because my friend is extremely sensitive, and I'm still Facebook friends with her, and her mom has since passed away, so I can't go asking. My mom probably indulged the phrase. Maybe my friend's mom said, let him discipline her since her real father isn't in the picture, which makes sense if you know how to appropriately discipline a child without leaving marks on their body and creating psychological trauma. Anyway, my mom went with it full force and let him discipline me until I confided in a mandated reporter. The only reason the abuse stopped was because a psychologist told my mom, if he hurts her again, you will end up in jail for knowingly leaving her with a dangerous person. So when my mom's neck was on the line, then it became a big deal for her. Story 40. When I was 14, I accidentally ran over an extension cord with a lawnmower. My dad had been charging his boat battery via this cord, but the outlet was on the opposite side of the house, and I had let the grass get a little long so I couldn't see it. There was a slight drizzle that day, and I was barefoot. I had Green Day's Dookie and my yellow waterproof Walkman, so life was pretty good. Anyway, I felt a chunk when the mower hit something, and when I came to, the tape had finished. I saw the remnants of my dad's 50-foot cord in the lawn, and knew I was effed. I finished the job and waited for him to get home. When he did, he was, of course, big mad. He whipped my ass red with the cord and then told me to fix it. Of course, I had no idea what I was doing. I was crying, my ass hurt, and I had been knocked unconscious from an electric shock. But I figured it out. It's really not that hard. To this day, I still know how to splice and reconnect those wires. Fix my own extension cord a few weeks ago. Story 41. It literally was a throw-her-in-the-pool-she'll-learn-to-swim teaching moment. Except it was a backyard swampy pond in my redneck side of the family Texas backyard, not a pool. I got thrown in with one of those foam floaties on my back and indeed figured it out. So my family went back to their beers and I was enjoying my newfound skill, paddling around. Ten minutes into it, I paid attention to the shore again and realized everyone was staring at me with a horrified look on their face, and my dad was yelling at me to come to him as he was jumping in. Turns out, their house was not too far from some effing alligator reserve, and occasionally, an alligator would escape and find his way to the pond. I got out in time. It was relatively small, and they just caught it, put it in a crate, and drove it back home nonchalantly. But I'm now forever terrified of natural bodies of water and a crap swimmer. Story 42. I know no one will ever read this, but my oldest wasn't able to swim until eight. I bring him to swim classes. Nope, nothing. At this point, I'm livid. Finally, I say something to the instructor. I need him to swim. Can you get him out of the baby area and get him to swim? I was kind of rude, but come on, four years of swim lessons and he's still having to be carried around the pool. She tells me next time he'll have a different coach who will have him swimming the same day. Great. We meet Josh. He personally guarantees my kid will swim. He tells my son to walk all the way to the other side of the pool. Josh swims over. Tells my kid to jump in. He's shaking his head no. Josh tells him, don't worry, I'll catch you. He jumps. 
Josh moves all the way back. You bet your ass he started swimming that day. A couple years later, I told him if he didn't start riding a bike, I would get Josh over here. I saved my brother's number as the name Josh, so I'd show him my phone that I was calling. Man, it was funny, but effed up just a tad. Okay, so, I mean, I understand, perhaps, the necessity of wanting your child to swim. That is a skill that could come in useful, but, like, why are you forcing your son to ride a bike? Seems like you're just more concerned with making your child uneasy and putting them in stressful situations, but that's just me. You started the post by saying, I know no one will ever read this, which I hate when people do that, by the way, but you're going to get a shout-out. It has been read, and now it's being commentated on on YouTube. Quit being mean to your child. Story 43. My mother used to enter me in random contests when I was a child without asking if I wanted to do them or not. One was a speech contest when I was nine. I was terrified of large crowds, and there were like 300 people watching in a panel of judges. When I stood up to give my speech, I was able to get through about half of a sentence, then forgot my entire speech, and apparently how to read my notes as well. I was so nervous. I just stood there stammering and found my mother sitting in the second row and just stared at her, hoping she would give me some direction. She stood up and walked out of the auditorium. I started straight up crying at this point. The judges just looked at me and never said anything. Finally, I asked through the tears, Can I just go? And one of the judges just nodded. I walked off stage and out the door. It was another 20 minutes or so before I found my mother. I'm still not sure where she went. I've never felt so alone and scared in my life. Story 44. I was in my mid-twenties and moved back in with my dad, trying to get away from drugs and alcohol that were prevalent in the nightclub I worked at. Living at home for a while was nice, but I guess I was getting on my dad's nerves and our disagreements escalated. I came home from work one day with my crap thrown at the front lawn and him demanding his key back, so I left. I spent five days on a friend's couch while I looked for a place to live. I ended up in a house owned by people I met in the after-hours club I hung out at. Great crowd, right? Lived in that house for maybe six to eight months before I was able to find a more stable place to live that didn't involve waking up at 3 a.m. to music being blasted from 200-watt powered amps. I remained close friends with one of the many transient roommates who floated through that house. One day, we got close and slept together. The next time I spent with this person, they'd completely changed and were super clingy. I felt uncomfortable with how they were behaving and wanted to go home, but they being my ride home, insisted that I stay. After being convinced with MDMA, read earlier drug problem, we ended up getting high and that's the night my child was conceived. 18 months later, I was in court and ordered to pay child support, and I've been paying for what feels like being essayed ever since. Now my dad only calls me when he wants to come visit my kid, who I don't have custody of, and who only visits when she feels like. The best way to describe what it feels like to be in this position is somber. It's like a heavy blanket of what feels like unfairness, always weighing me down and preventing me from doing the things I'd like to do with my life, like start a business or try to move to another city. I never wanted to bring a kid into this world without having two parents that worked as a team, and now I've ended up a single parent without guardianship rights to my kid. Story 45. Actually, I have a story much like the title. I was about six when I and my stepdad at the time went to the beach. It started as a normal beach day, and I couldn't really swim, so I stayed in the shallow part of the ocean because I loved, and still do love, the ocean. Well, as a kid does, I pushed the limits of how far I could go, and eventually just got far enough where I couldn't touch the sand. I started freaking out and yelling for him, because the rip current was terrible that day. So, I had started to get carried out, and kept going under the water, then bobbing up every few seconds. The whole time, he kept yelling back, Figure it out! You'll eventually get it. That part was a vivid memory because it made it hard to yell for help when you're trying to get a little more oxygen to breathe. After about 30 seconds of that, which felt like an eternity to me, a lifeguard eventually swam in and grabbed me, bringing me to shore, and started to yell at my stepdad for doing nothing about it. Ah, the memories. Story 46. When I was a dumb kid, I thought it would be fun to take the dog for a walk while wearing rollerblades. You know, to go zoom and stuff. As you would expect, it was all well and good one day until a wayward stray cat crossed our path and my dog chased the cat. I fell down really hard and at an awkward angle on account of the rollerblades, but I was able to hang on to the leash. After I got control of my dog, I took my rollerblades off and limped home. I told my parents what happened, and they were like, Well, you're walking, so what's the problem? My leg really hurts, I explained. 
Their response? Just take some ibuprofen, he'll be fine. About four days later, my leg was very swollen, turning purple, and I told my mom that I felt like a golf ball was painfully rolling down the inside of my calf over and over. I was also having trouble putting any weight on the leg at all. Turns out I had torn a ligament in my leg, and my parents' response was literally for me to walk it off. Story 47. Well, my dad literally did this to me in a motel pool. More specifically, he let go of me in the pool. I was maybe five? I remember falling backwards through the water and beginning to swallow a lot of water. I don't know why it took him so long to get me, and my brother was a bit older than me in there too. No one else was there, and I was already vomiting by the time he brought me back up. I didn't see anyone, he just washed me off in the shower, but as a currently certified lifeguard, I know it could have gone very differently. I'm of course glad that it did not, but please seek immediate medical attention if you nearly drown or in a similar situation. Story 48 when I was in the 6th grade, a boy in the 8th grade, but held back twice, intentionally slammed my head in the bus window. My town was super small, 600 people, and I lived in the center of a dead-end dirt road. The boy that did it lived at the end of the road. My middle school was four towns over, and when I got to school, my thumb was black and blue and super swollen. I went to the nurse's office, and I'm not sure why. I think she had beef with my mother, because my mom liked to punch people back then. But she dismissed my complaints and told me to get to class. I went all day in level 10 pain. Since our school was four towns over, the bus ride home was 45 minutes. And by the time I got there, my mom had already left for work, ER nurse, in the same town I went to school in. This is around 1991, so no cell phones, and it was a long-distance call from school on a payphone. I had pretty much zero contact with her some days. My mother called to check in with us that night. It was 8 p.m. and we were getting ready for bed, and my sister told her that my hand looked horrible. Mom rushes the 45 minutes home from work, picks me up, drives me to the nearest hospital, which was 45 minutes away, and after a few hours in the ER and several x-rays, we learned that not only was the growth disc slipped, but my thumb was shattered just below the third knuckle. My mother was pissed. When we pulled onto our road, she was still fuming and drove right past our house and down to the neighbor's house. She beeped the horn when we arrived and the boy's mother walked out. My 5 foot, 2 inches tall and 105 pound mother punched her right in the nose, hauled back and it was like a crack heard around the world. My mom was stressed that week and rarely ever went out, but decided to go to unwind. She went to the local watering hole with a few friends, and she happened to run into the school nurse. Three bouncers had to pull my mom off her. The nurse transferred to another school in the district the next year. I'm pretty sure my mom had something to do with it. Story 49. I'm 36 and don't know how to swim. Reason for it is because when I was 8, my mom sent me to a swimming class at a private pool. I was scared of water deeper than my height. After a few sessions in shallow water, the swimming teacher took us to four meters deep side of the pool and asked all the seven to eight-year-olds to jump in one by one. I was the last one, and to this day, I remember how scared I was. Once my turn, I refused and said I didn't know how to do it. The a-hole teacher grabbed my hand, dragged me with him, and threw me in the deep water, like how you throw a rag doll at a garbage bin. Then he picked up a long stick and put it a meter away from me, without getting into the water, and told me to grab that if I don't want to drown. I was constantly going underwater and screaming for help. It may sound surreal saying it, but 30 years later, I still sometimes have nightmares of this at night. Took a good 15 to 20 seconds before I managed to grab the stick and come up. He then looked at me, pointed at me while I was crying, and told all the kids to not be as pathetic as me. I never told my mom what happened because I was scared back then. Of the teacher, not my mom. Looking back at it now, that was an attempted murder. Story 50. When I was in high school, I wrecked my parents' car. It was an automatic. From that point on, I was afraid to drive. One day, my dad came home with a little 1977 Honda CVCC wagon. It was a standard. He told me to get in, drove me way out of town, I mean way out in the hills. He pointed to the clutch, brake, gas, and shift. Explained how things worked, told me to get in and drive. I said no. Then I noticed my mom arrive in a car behind us. He got out and said, It's a hell of a long walk back to town. Figure it out and drive back. Or walk. I don't care. Then he got in her car and left me. 
I was furious. I started walking, and then back to the car, then away. I swear it was like a damn movie scene where some guy's on a road yelling at himself. I finally got in the car and started home. I grind and bunny hopped and stalled the damn thing all the way home. At some point, I figured it out, and that's how I learned to drive a standard. Story 51. My parents were like this with cooking. I came to my mom once in high school because I wanted to try to make something in a cookbook literally called The Girl Can't Cook. She did all of the prep work, and then when it was time to cook it and I didn't know what to do, she angrily grabbed the pan from me and literally shoved me out of the way. About two years later, school was trying to get us to pick colleges, and I chose cooking school because I knew I was going to move out soon and I didn't know how to do anything but make cereal. I told my mom that I'd chosen cooking school, and she laughed hysterically and then said, Oh, wait, you're serious. I have a culinary degree now, and my mom doesn't ever leave her house. Please, if you're reading this far in, and you're considering having kids one day, or even have siblings who are neglected slash struggling, please teach your kids to cook. I thought all my life that I hated eggs, but it turns out that what I hate is the taste of them burning in the pan because mom was busy. Story 52. So my aunt has always been a very visual parent. She always went to the kids' stuff at school, posted them on Facebook, but when it came to actually parenting, she wouldn't lift a finger. My uncle is a literal gaming addict and just never did crap, period. With the setup out of the way, I had been sent to live with them for a couple of years. My dad was even more neglectful than they were. I ended up basically raising their kids, including taking them to the pool every single day. The kids were around 7 and 10 when this happened, and neither of them could swim. I started with teaching the 10-year-old first, and she got the hang of it pretty quick. The 7-year-old has some kind of learning disability that everyone in the family knows he has, but Auntie refuses to get him diagnosed. Anti-vax mental health. Shocker. I start teaching him, and even over a year later, he's still a very poor swimmer, and I don't let him in the deep end without floaties. That summer, we ended up going to a water park with a large slide that ended in a seven-foot deep bowl. I tell Auntie not to let him go on it because he can't swim well enough to drop that low, and she responds with an angry, My son can swim! Despite the fact that she hadn't actually taken them swimming in any of the two years I had lived there, he got on the ride despite me pleading and being told to shut up. When he got to the bottom, he said the pool was dark and he couldn't swim back to the top. He nearly drowned, having to be saved by a lifeguard. The ride got shut down for two hours because of this, just because she couldn't accept her kid wasn't perfect. Story 53. My father didn't understand that if you want a child to know how to do a chore, you have to teach them. He also didn't understand that a child under 10 didn't have the time management skills to create a routine to do housework on their own and needed adult supervision to oversee things of that nature. For these reasons, he spent most of my childhood screaming at me for being stupid or lazy for not being able to efficiently clean his house from top to bottom. One memorable occasion involved him throwing a fit because I couldn't figure out how to mop the kitchen without a bucket to mix cleaning solution. He called me a moron for not having the problem-solving skills to know that I could empty the kitchen sink and plug the drain to use it as a bucket then screamed at me for accidentally knocking the drain plug out with the mop, insisting that I purposely messed it up to try and manipulate him into not making me do chores in the future. Memories like this are a large part of why I'm glad he's dead. Story 54. I was a lifeguard. A mother threw her son into the deep end of the pool. I intervened when it became clear he was incapable of treading water. A fight with the parents ensued as we explained that their child must pass a deep water test to be allowed in the deep end. They insisted their child was perfectly capable of swimming. We said, that's fine, so let him do the test. If he can swim, he'll pass, no problem. He hopped in the shallow end of the pool, swam the length of the pool, and then had to tread water for five minutes. Just as he got to the deep end of the pool, his dad scooped him up out of the water. He insisted he should get a chance to rest before treading water. After much arguing, the kid got back in the pool and treaded water, with his head going under after about three minutes. This immediately led to the parents pitching a fit about how the test isn't fair. Mind you, it's to ensure their child doesn't drown. My manager, in his infinite wisdom, relented and issued the kid a deep water band. This was despite the fact that this child would clearly drown in a matter of minutes of being in the deep end. And of course, I'm the one who needs to save the kid when their parents' stupidity inevitably endangers the kid's life. Thankfully, the child proved to be smarter than any of the adults involved in this situation. He stayed in shallow water for the rest of the day. 
day. Story 55. When I was very little, my father stood me on the edge of the pool and got in, standing in front of me. I was terrified of the water. He put his arms out and said, jump to me, I won't move. I said, you promise you won't move? And he nodded and said, yes, I promise, just jump in. I stood at the abyss, freaked out. I screwed up my courage and looked at him standing about two feet away and thought, I can do this, I can. So I squeezed my eyes shut, jumped as far as I could, and started swimming as best as I could toward him. I couldn't find him. My eyes were still closed, and I started freaking out and swimming further. Where was he? Why couldn't I find him? I was splashing and throwing my arms out trying to find him, when all of a sudden I touched him and grabbed on. I was terrified and crying and happy that I found him. Obviously, it was my fault I couldn't swim well enough to get through those two feet to him. I wasn't a good swimmer. I had failed at swimming. Years later, my father laughingly told me he kept backing up as I swam, thinking he was teaching me self-reliance and confidence, how to tough it out. It actually taught me the opposite. It made me doubt myself. I wonder what would be different if he hadn't moved and instead let me feel the accomplishment of getting past my little kid fears. Story 56 My dad took it upon himself to teach my baby sister and I how to ride bikes which, with his anger management problems and total inability to bond with either of us, was a recipe for disaster. He took us to a park and said we weren't leaving until we could bike home. At one point, he had to duct tape my hands to the handlebars. Things did not go well. We were actually sort of getting the hang of it several hot hours later. No water, no brakes, just lots of angry whispers and rough bruises from being squeezed or lightly shaken until we stopped sniffling. Crying was for babies. We were biking around the pond, me trailing my sister, until she slammed on her brakes because a snake slithered across the path. She wailed and I swerved to avoid hitting her. I hit a crack in the pavement and with my hands still duct taped to the handlebars, I couldn't figure out how to stop. I hit the grass, lost control, and crashed into the pond, whereupon I started screaming. There is a police station on the other side of the woods, just a thin corpse of trees from this park. Dad came running over, yelling at us both. My sister had dropped her bike and was hugging herself, sobbing because she felt like she was to blame for me sitting in the marsh. Dad sloughed into the mud, ripped my hands off the handlebars, ripped off the tape, slapped me to make me stop sniffling, and told us to take our asses to the car. He was so done with us. Then he stormed off, kicking every loose rock and stopping to shake a tree before disappearing behind the bathroom. My left pinky was in agony and still gets painfully numb when it gets cold. My sister was, of course, no help, so I just got sick of her sobbing, grabbed both bikes, and followed. There were two cop cars in the parking lot, and my dad was scary calm, trying to explain away the howling they'd heard. Of course, we didn't say anything. We were terrified of getting beaten the minute we got home, which we got anyway, but you know. Neither of us ever learned how to ride a bike, and he still gets disgusted when he remembers. He thinks we're fat, lazy idiots because he traumatized us. Story 57. Not parenting, but boot camp. It was swim week. If you were a competent swimmer, it was Skate City. But if you had trouble at all, it was a week-long nightmare. One or two were pushed off the jump tower when they wouldn't jump, then had to redo it for improper form. People who had trouble treading water would wrap themselves around other swimmers. One kid was having so much trouble with the tread water that he tried to grab the edge of the pool, but the drill instructor just kept pushing him back with a broom handle. One recruit actually made it up over the edge of the pool, stood up, and immediately was Spartan kicked back in. If you passed the first day, you would come back for other days for higher swim qualifications, while those who did poorly came back to do the same basic qualification again. The good swimmers relentlessly mocked the bad swimmers, even telling them they should end themselves. Keep in mind, the drill instructors were looking for every little reason to disqualify someone for any event, so it was almost a matter of luck as to who was disqualified. That's the setting. While I was done sitting in the bleachers, I hear a shout. The alarm is pulled, and a red light glows. I barely catch a glimpse of the recruit lying motionless on the deck. The drill instructor starts shouting for us to leave and make a formation outside, per the policy we'd been briefed on at the beginning of the day. There were all sorts of rumors that day saying the guy died, but I was able to sneak some news from a buddy in the medical platoon during chow that he had survived but had broken ribs. Recruits are allotted one hour at the end of every day when they're allowed to talk to each other. Edit. I just read the comments and realized this post was not actually just about pools. LOL. Story 58. My whole life as a child, I would get stomach acid coming up into my throat when I laid down to go to bed at night. I had no idea what it was, so I would tell my parents I felt sick, and for a while they'd give me Tums or Gravol to help. 
After a couple months of that, they told me I was addicted to the pills and refused to give them to me anymore or to take me to a doctor to find out why I felt like I was going to throw up every night. They basically said, you'll figure it out, you're fine. I was like five. Fast forward 25 years later and I have terrible digestive issues because I had no idea acid reflux was a thing and it was destroying my esophagus. Plus, I was probably ingesting stuff I was allergic to for many years, so my entire health is just a mess. I also had the pool experience. With my entire family drunk, they decided I'd learn if they just threw me in. I almost drowned because they weren't even paying attention until someone noticed I hadn't come back up after they tossed me in. Fun times. So we're a little past the halfway point in this video, and I'm honestly surprised how many responses so far have taken the title question literally about sink or swim moments in a swimming pool. But it just has me wonder, you know, so many people are like, man, I almost drowned. I almost died. I could have died. How many stories out there are there? where parents do this or have done it, and the child unfortunately does end up passing away due to negligence on behalf of the parent. Hope that number is not high, obviously, but I'm sure that there have been cases, you know, across human history where this unfortunately has been the case. So morbid thought, but just something that popped into my head. Sorry for the tangent. Let's get back on track here. Story 59. I used my college fund to pay for the divorce. Made me shred the evidence. I actually put two and two together and figured out slash got a confession from them for that like two weeks ago, thanks to my therapist, coincidentally. Don't worry about the money. Just do it for education, lol. Couldn't apply for any special grants slash loans slash scholarships, whatever, because parents were on high income bracket, so according to the system, I was an ultra rich kid despite not having more than a thousand dollars in the bank at all, at once ever as an adult before I turned 27. Yes, I celebrated the crap out of it because it also marked me having finished aggressively paying off my college scam loans. Come time for housing, it was, well, we're already putting the others through college, and you're the oldest, so you should be able to afford. Back in my day, college at Wendy's was $6 billion an hour, blah, blah, blah. Come time for starving in the winter night, need a place to stay. Find a place, need a hundred bucks, but lol, can't transfer money overnight because of the wire fee. Gonna do the two to three day transfer instead. You'll survive the cold, you're an Eagle Scout. Yeah, I'm still pretty salty about all that. Fortunately, mine happened to be closer to the cost at the time, so my brother was spared my fate. My step-siblings were obviously unaffected, but they at least got the free housing. Man, just like effing everything at any time would have been helpful. Thanks for the place to vent, OP. Story 60. Not parenting, but a more extreme version of the title. My parents would enroll us in all kinds of after-school activities. Some we would keep up until we got bored, then it was on to the next until we found the one that stuck. Anyway, that journey included swimming lessons in a prestigious school that had, like, really big-name trainers in the world of national swimming. Obviously, the kids' class wasn't taught by Olympians, but most teachers were hard asses, and this was the 90s. On one lesson, we were doing an exercise where we had to get underwater and hold our breath for a minute. I sucked at this. I would come up for air in like 20 to 30 seconds. The trainer had enough of me failing after two to three tries and came over to help. His idea of help was to grab my head and, without warning, shove it underwater and hold me down. Keep in mind, I'm like six to seven, so I have literally no way to resist. I was splashing so hard trying to get away that he finally did. And then he yelled at me for getting his clothes wet. That was my final lesson. To this day, I'm terrified of any form of swimming where I have to be face down. I learned the backstroke, though, so I can at least do something at the beach other than a dog paddle. Story 61. 15 years old. I know it's much older than many of the stories here, but it's the first thing that came to mind. I was working at a summer camp in Wyoming, and I had stayed at the camp for almost the whole summer. The last day the camp was open was also the same day we had to take everything down. And I mean everything. Putting all the rowboats and canoes away, taking all the various tents down, deep cleaning the camp lodge, etc. We also had participants still in the camp we had to help out and inspect their campsites and such, and we were all heading home that afternoon slash evening, so it was incredibly busy with having to pack up and clean everything. So the day was already stressful enough, and what happened next really screwed me up to this day. I'm 23 now. My parents were staying at a separate campground about a mile up the road from the camp where I worked at. 
Mom told me they were going to go hiking, and for the moment, they took a lot of the stuff I had already picked up. The deal was that I would finish doing all the cleaning around camp and then hike up to the campground and just chill in the trailer for a couple of hours while they were out hiking. Well, I hadn't had the chance to pack everything up, and my dad, who has a very short temper that is often unjustified, just absolutely lost it and beat the crap out of me in my tent. He also had a .45 strapped to his belt. He's military and carries a gun everywhere, and I seriously feared for my life. One of the camp rangers saw the incident and the police were called. My parents left before police arrived. There was a family that took me in for a little bit while all the court stuff was happening. My mom was trying to stop the violence from happening, so she wasn't in trouble with the law. However, when I finally went back home, mom would blame me for the stuff that happened. And when I went to the doctor after the incident, they diagnosed me with anxiety, depression, OCD, and PTSD. Trying to cope with everything was hell in a handbasket. Mom definitely didn't help at all and basically had the mentality of get over it and you shouldn't have allowed it to happen. Dad didn't go to jail, but I seriously wish he did because the rest of high school was a crap storm. We got in fights all the time, sometimes turning physical. Our family lost a lot of sympathy from the church we went to. We became dysfunctional really quickly and for a very long time. I didn't want to be home and would take extra shifts at Wendy's just so I didn't have to be home. It was miserable, but at least I got a considerable amount of money. My girlfriend at the time dumped me because she didn't want to deal with the fact that I didn't know how to cope with trauma. I moved out at 18. Things for me are much better now. I'm married and have a good job and I'm in college. I do, however, have a lot of baggage left and my wife gets exhausted with it. To this day, I'm still having to learn how to cope with the trauma, but my wife has been supporting me. Story 62. 1983 YMCA. I'm five years old and my mother signed me up for swimming lessons in New Hampshire. I've never liked deep water as I sink. I've always just sunk. Even today, as I love swimming now, I swim underwater as staying afloat requires a full breath of air being held as long as I can. I've apparently joined halfway into the classes. The instructor lines us all up and straps on a life jacket type thing. It's a piece of styrofoam hooked up like a backpack. I'm smaller than most of the class, but I get a pack too, so I'm blended in pretty well. They then march us to the diving board, and one by one, everyone in line jumped. I've never been on a board or in the deep end before. My turn comes, and I just jumped like everyone else. Now, if you've made it this far, you know I sink. Well, you guessed it. I sank like a rock. Floating device and all. I remember just sitting at the bottom, holding my breath. After that, I was out of the pool, and the adults were all around me. It took them forever to get me back in the water, and I had to keep going twice a week for the next few years. I love all things water now. My dumbass just tried to sit on the bottom of the pool to figure out how to get out. No plan. Didn't tell anyone else I didn't know how to swim. TLDR, natural selection, should have taken me at five. Story 63. I had a severe speech impediment growing up. I was in speech therapy until I was 13. I still have moments where it flares up and I turn to my husband and he says the word I'm struggling with and I watch his mouth and repeat. My parents wouldn't do that. They never sat in on my therapy lessons, just stood there and yelled at me to use your words. I literally couldn't. I was learning to mimic people's mouth movements to pronounce words. I wouldn't even tell my parents that much because I literally couldn't. My speech was a garbled mess until I was about 10 when I was able to begin stringing full sentences. My speech took so long to come along because my parents were useless and wouldn't talk with me and I was severely bullied. I was only talking to my speech therapist. When my little brother started showing signs of the same speech impediment that I did, I convinced my parents to enroll him with the same teacher. And when my parents started the same BS, use your words, I flipped out. All the rage I felt as a kid that couldn't defend and explain herself exploded out of me. It made my mom cry, but I don't regret it. My brother didn't spend even half the time in speech therapy like I had to. Story 64. Backstory. Every kid is born with flat feet and eventually develops arches. I, on the other hand, developed collapsed arches as a child and therefore have extremely unstable ankles. Years ago, when I was a freshman in high school, I was late to a class and decided to run to get there before the bell rang. My left ankle rolled. Hard. My ankle basically touched the floor with my shin still upright. I limped into class, went 
down to the nurse's office and walked out with crutches. That day I went home, showed my ER nurse mom my black and blue foot, and she said, it's fine, just ice it. Anyone with family in the medical field knows they're the worst patients and tend to minimize just about everything. My foot was black and blue for weeks. Fast forward about 10 years, I'm 25, and I have a dedicated podiatrist due to continued sprains. My podiatrist very excitedly tells me during my first appointment that I have the flattest feet he's ever seen, and there were physicians in Columbus that would love to see them, which is probably one of the weirdest things a doctor has ever told me next to my eye doctor telling me I should hope for an early onset of cataracts for a lens replacement. Anyways, one day I sprained my left ankle, which I hadn't yet sprained while seeing this doctor. Most of the time, it's the right ankle. As usual, he takes a quick x-ray to check. And then he tells me that I have evidence of a past fracture on my left ankle from years prior that didn't heal correctly. Not anything critical, but just something he noticed. And I knew immediately that it was that one day back in high school when my mom told me, Oh, it's fine. You're just a hypochondriac. I was walking around on a broken ankle for weeks because my mom, who's an ER nurse, was so certain it wasn't broken. As my grandma would say, the motto was, you'll live if you don't die. I still give her crap for it to this day. Story 65. Changing a light bulb. Me. Is the power on? Stepdad. Stick your finger in there and see. This one is a bit harder to explain. My grandfather had about 150 head of cattle. All beef master. A few show cows, etc. When I was 15, I was sent to live with him while I was on probation. And of course, he put my ass to work. But I had never worked on a cattle farm. So we're out in the field and he tells me to go get this ring thing. A big metal ring that goes around bales of hay. It was in the middle of the field, stuck in the mud. What I needed to do? Flip it up onto its side and roll it to the new location. What happened? I struggled across the field, knee-deep in mud, in my airwalks, by the way. Then I tried to flip it up on its side and get under the bottom edge real quick, but it was stuck in the mud. That effing thing came right back at my face as I was trying to get underneath it. Hit me right in the mouth, laid me out flat on my back, almost completely submerged in mud. Granddad, you goddamn idiot! What the hell you doing? He stomped over, lifted it from the side with a twist, rotating it up with one hand. Easy. At this point, I'm spitting blood and bits of broken teeth when he tells me to get back to work. Get your ass up and roll that over to where I told you to. Story 66. My parents were always pretty supportive in that sense and just tended to overlook a few things in my childhood that would have been helpful to know slash notice earlier on. The time where I got thrown in the deep end was actually the school district's fault. I was in an advanced math program where I was doing high school math and middle school. The school undersold how rigorous the course would be and underprepared me and several other students who were struggling. The course made it so that you couldn't drop out after a week, and we realized too late that it would be too stressful for me. The most frustrating thing about it was that the school system left out details about how hard the course was so that more people would join making the school look better on paper. My parents wouldn't have put me in there if they knew it was going to have a catastrophic effect on my, at the time, mild anxiety disorders, leaving me with a hard time finding coping mechanisms for similar situations that aren't destructive. My parents had continuously complained to the school about the way it was set up, but since I managed to pull out a 93 on the 7th grade test and a 96 on the 8th grade one, my parents were never taken seriously. Story 67. Well, it was the early 90s and my father decided business was good. So, like a good dad, he wanted to give what he wasn't allowed to have when he was a child. Flash to him buying a YZ80 motorcycle. Now, I don't know if you've ever driven one of these things out. They have a power band that snaps into action out of nowhere. So, he rides it around a couple of times and says, See? It's easy. Now, my nine-year-old self had driven a golf cart and some mini bikes, four-stroke, so I knew the basics, besides the clutch. So, he explains it and I hop on give the throttle a good snap rotation, and drop the clutch. Fortunately, that bike stood up immediately and tore off down the road, flipping onto its side and doing a couple and over-end over-ends before settling its tire into the sand, propped up on its handlebar end. Meanwhile, the throttle is stuck open, and this thing is just throwing sand everywhere while slowly turning. I was freaked out, but Pops just walked over and shut it off. But a few tries later, I got the gist of the clutch and brake. Mom would have been furious to watch those first few rides. Miss those bikes. They were cheap, ugly, and ridiculously fun to ride. Good times. Story 68. When I was a toddler, I found one of my mom's bobby pins on the floor. 
I looked at the electrical outlet on the wall, and the gears started turning in my head. As I began the journey of satisfying my curiosity, my mom saw what I was intent on doing and leapt off the couch. But my grandpa, her father, stopped her. He must have been watching me and knew what was coming a few seconds before she did. He put his arm across her chest and told her to sit back down. I proceeded to give myself a really good jolt and started screaming bloody murder. It felt like I had been hit by an invisible car. It was only then that my grandpa allowed my mom to rush to my aid. I've not effed around with live electrical outlets ever since. Even now, as a grown man, I check twice that the breaker is off before I do any kind of electrical work in my house. I learned a valuable lesson that day. Thanks, Grandpa. Story 69. I actually threw myself into the pool, lol. I forgot that I couldn't swim without my floaties. Needless to say, I did learn pretty quickly, but not before seeing my mom laugh her ass off. My brother saved me, but that little push gave me the understanding needed to swim. Several years later, after that, we were desperately moving states away, and since she was struggling with addiction and coming down, she drove two hours south of our destination. I had to get a road map and Lewis and Clark our asses across two states. Made it work, though. Thank F for reliable signs and ancient roads. My dad, on the other hand, had more chances to have me learn to swim, but I wasn't ever really good enough, so he just prepared me to be bad or subpar. Sudden realization of actual problems I may have. But there was an instance where we were visiting a friend of his that lived a little out of town. He didn't have gas or electricity, so he lit a fire every night. One particular night, the sun starts going down, and he said that I'd better light a fire. I was never sure if he was joking or not, and I'm still not entirely sure. But yeah, telling a child to build a fire or freeze to death is a pretty rough way to go get tossed in a pool, lol. After putting it all together, I asked for a lighter, and he said, you don't have one. As in, if I was asking for one, I couldn't have one, because apparently I didn't come prepared. By this time, the sun was gone, and he really made it clear that if I was by myself out there, that night would have sucked. His friend tossed a ball of paper soaked with a little bit of lighter fluid, and then a lit match into the fire pit. And my little wood teepee went up in flames. The warmth of that and every other fire has always kindled the idea of how rough life must have been before modern comforts like gas and electricity. Story 70. I've got something super relevant to this analogy and parenting style. Years ago, when I was a lifeguard in the army, long, stupid, stupid story, I was lifeguarding the on-post pool and a dad comes in with his two kids. They seem nervous, but he says, oh, they're going to learn how to swim. We gave them the pitch for our swimming lessons that we offered, but he was like, nah, I'll teach them. Immediately, the kids aren't having a great time. They started off on the steps, more nervous. The dad gets frustrated. My rotation's up, so I have to change out and guard the kiddie pool where they probably should have started. At this point, the kids are crying as the dad is trying to get them to kick as he pulls them along in the water along the surface. I'm busy guarding the kiddie pool. All of a sudden, the crying and screaming stops. I look up and the dad is dunking the kid underwater. The kid comes up gargling water and screaming. We didn't have the authority to kick him out on the spot, but we strongly suggested he take a break, and they left with some information on swimming lessons. Kind of makes my blood boil looking back. Story 71. In this story, I'm the villain. I feel like an ass about it. When my daughter was 18, her girlfriend was in an unhappy living situation. It wasn't an emergency or anything, but it was making her miserable, so my daughter wanted to rescue her by getting an apartment with her. I didn't approve because I felt she was too young, but also didn't want to crap on her aspirations. I decided to let her make a go of it, and if she managed to get an apartment and get moved in and stuff, I'd happily admit I was wrong. But I didn't give her any help or guidance, because I figured she wouldn't be able to make it happen with no credit, etc. To my surprise, she found a decent basement apartment for her and her girlfriend. I was impressed. Yeah, it was a fraud. She got ripped off for about $1,400. I regret not asking more questions and giving more advice. On a happy note, her girlfriend got out of the unhappy situation, and now at 21, my daughter is living independently and successfully. Her dad and I help with medical bills sometimes, but otherwise she handles everything herself. Story 72 I dated a woman who had a 17-year-old POS of a son. He dropped out of high school, refused to work or contribute to the household, stole from and bullied his younger sibling, constantly stole money, including the mortgage payment at one point, and even punched his mother in the face when confronted about it. She turned to me begging for help, but refused to involve the police because she didn't want to damage any chance at a future he might have. 
So on the day of his 18th birthday, I took her to the courthouse and we started a legal eviction process. About a week later, he served the eviction notice signed by a judge. By a sheriff's deputy, bright and early, while he's still in bed, giving him 20 days to vacate. For the next 20 days, he makes zero effort to prepare because he assumes his mother is bluffing. I too thought she might relent. On the 20th day, she calls the sheriff's deputies and has him formally trespassed right there on the spot. I was there that day, and the look of shock on his effing face was priceless. You people have no idea what that woman was going through. She showed real strength that day. Even his younger sister was glad he was going. The deputies tell him to vacate immediately or go to jail, so he packs as much of his belongings as he can carry into two trash bags and leaves, crying like an effing baby the whole time. He ends up homeless for almost a year until he finally finds work through a day labor service and is able to turn that into a full-time job with a construction company. Now he's somewhat self-reliant working on a GED and trying to mend his relationships. He's still a little prick, but at least he's trying. Story 73. I was playing flag football in PE. The other guy tied the flag to his belt. I fell when diving for his flag, but it wrapped around my ring finger and pulled and twisted the finger. It was so cold outside, I didn't think anything of the pop because there was no pain. It swelled, but I figured I bothered the joint. 30 minutes later, when we went inside and the pain began, I went to the school nurse who gave me an ice pack. My fingernail was pointing to my pinky finger. She called my mom and said she was sorry to bother her, but she had to call home for injuries. But I probably bent my finger wrong and I'd be fine. My mom had no reason to not believe her. I went through the rest of the day as the finger swelled and the whole thing turned black and blue. All my teachers sent me to the nurse, but she doubled down that I was fine, and then called my mom again saying I was fine and just looking to get out of class. It was at that point my mom came and got me, because I didn't behave that way. She took one look at my finger, and we went to the hospital. I had two surges, pins, and an eight-week cast. I've never seen my mom so angry. She personally called every school board member and started at 9.15 that night. She said, sorry to wake you, but then she wouldn't have had to call them if the nurse had done her job. When I came back to school, we had a new nurse and I was excused from any PE, including alternate assignments, while my broken finger healed. Story 74. My dad literally did this to my siblings. I'm the eldest and I don't remember him tossing me in, but if he did it to his other two children, I expect he also did it to me. My brother in particular always hated water. After our dad threw him into a pool multiple times, guess he thought little bro would either get it eventually or drown. My brother was so afraid of swimming that he refused to participate in his school swimming lessons for over a year. I eventually taught him to swim with the help of my husband and our son. I started teaching my son to swim when he was five weeks old. He went to the pool for the first time at seven weeks old. The child could swim before he could walk and loves the water, so when my brother saw a literal baby doing what he'd been afraid to do, I think it really drove home that if he believed in himself, he could do it. I quite often got comments from other parents during the baby swim who were concerned that my son wasn't okay when, as a toddler, he wanted to die for his toys in the deep end. He couldn't reach the bottom on his own, so once he had put himself under, I would give him a push. He would grab the toy, push off from the bottom, and shoot up to the surface. We both had giggles, and I always went under with him. I wish someone had questioned my dad the same way. Story 75. Basically, I was never taught anything about life. I wasn't taught how to pay bills, how to find an apartment, how to get a job. Pretty easy and basic crap. As my high school years started drawing to a close, I would ask my mom constantly to show me effing something. I knew my days living there were numbered. As the oldest of three, my mom was counting down the days to have one less mouth to feed, but she was always too busy. She couldn't be bothered. They should be teaching us this in the school, she said. Well, my mom told me to leave at 18, and I spent the next five years in homeless shelters since I had no job or money. Her exact words whenever I asked her for any help at all, a effing sandwich, an hour or two to wash my clothes were, it's tough love, you'll figure it out. Fast forward 10 years or so, and I figured it out. After five years of incarceration and enough emotional scars to last me a few lifetimes, I survived, but barely. I also don't blame her for all my problems, but most of them could have been avoided if I had a smoother transition into living on my own. I went from a middle-class suburb kid to straight-up survival mode on the block literally overnight. She's dead now, and I love and miss her every day, but I will never effing get over that. Story 76. 
While not as extreme as others, when I was 10 to 11, there was this sport carnival I had to go to for school. I'm awful at running, and I think there might be something wrong with my knees. The race was very long, and I truly did my best, but my knees started to really hurt, and I fell over. My mom was at the carnival, and her and my friends came over and started telling me I could do it. My friends weren't the problem, just to clarify. My mom started jogging really slow beside me and telling me to just keep going. After I finally got to the end, I was last, of course. I fell on the ground and stayed there for ages. I think I have rejection-sensitive disorder, meaning any slight hint of disappointment in me, among other things, causes me to get very upset. When we got home, Mum and Dad yelled at me about how much I embarrassed them and how disappointed they were in me. I couldn't explain myself properly because I was so upset, and they just kept yelling. They kept saying that I just wasn't trying hard enough. That has stuck with me to this day. Story 77. When I was a small child, my dad used to hold me down and force liquid medicine down my throat when I was sick. It resulted in me never telling him I felt sick. Fast forward to a few years ago. My dad felt I was manic and testified in front of a judge and jury that I was a danger to myself. He lied under oath in order to institutionalize me for my own good. He said I lost 10 pounds in a week, when in reality I had been working out and eating healthy every day for over a year because I was obese and tired of living like a slob. I have good insurance, so the psych ward helped me for as long as possible, and my mom had to hire an attorney to get me out of there. Negative 100,000 out of 10 worst experiences of my life. We still talk, but I don't think I can ever forgive him for that. He's never even apologized. It feels evil to say, but I can't wait to stick him in a crappy nursing home against his will, lol. Not forever. I just want him to understand what he put me through. It just sucks. Story 78. I want to add that I'm a swimming instructor and teach people who are deathly afraid of the water or had a bad experience. I've taught every age from toddlers to 90 years old. Taught blind and disabled, amputees, you name it. A majority of my clients had something like this occur at some point. In no way does throwing someone in the water help them learn to swim. Only maybe 1-2% to of the time will this not produce a negative outcome. They might get their head wet without incident, but they aren't going to have the fundamental basics just by getting thrown in. I've spent months with some people just helping them make friends with getting their face wet and blowing bubbles out their nose. I've even had to work with a kid on just getting their feet wet for a while. IDK, it's just a traumatic experience for a shy kid who's already uncertain to be thrown in. Story 79. My parents were generally very good at not doing this sort of thing, but there was this one time. So my family is in the middle of a move to an apartment. My dad asked me to come with him and my mom to take insurance pictures of the place since I was the photographer of the family. I told him I didn't feel well. He thought I was bullcrapping, but less than 20 minutes after he left, I started crapping myself incessantly. Made it to the toilet, though. When they got back a couple of hours later, I was crapping and vomiting. I couldn't drink water without vomiting. Anyway, they went to bed, lol, and told me to just get some sleep and wait it out. I couldn't move without crapping myself, though. I woke up my parents a couple times with my moaning and pain, to which they tried to get me to quiet down. By 2 a.m., I was lying on the floor, unable to move, though still making a fair bit of noise. At that time, my mom was tired of my whining and called the nurse hotline to prove to me there's nothing to worry about so that I would stop asking for help. The nurse was mortified that I hadn't been taken to the emergency room hours ago since I hadn't been able to drink water for like seven hours at this point and was extremely dehydrated. The nurse heavily chastised my mom, lol. So she drives me to the hospital and they hook me up with IVs and it was probably the most satisfying sensation I've ever felt. I passed out immediately and woke up a few hours later feeling much better. I got to take a few days off school after that. Finally got to watch Dr. Strangelove. Anyway, this one's not as bad as the others because my parents aren't monsters, but they can be unempathetic at times, lol. Not to mention their tendency to underestimate sickness in young people. Honestly, I feel a lot of schadenfreude looking back, knowing my mom didn't get any sleep while I was past the F out, lol. My dad got off easy, though, lol. He just slept through it all. Good times. Not to mention that it was genuinely interesting to experience such a close call with death that was only avoided thanks to a persuasive nurse, lol. My parents have since taken the gastroenteritis much more seriously, lol. Story 80. Before I entered kindergarten, I only spoke Spanish. Going into kindergarten, I was surrounded by just English speakers. I don't regret learning Spanish as my first language, but it was so unfair how my parents automatically expected me to know English. When I would get my packets of homework, I would start crying. 
I didn't understand what it was asking for, and I couldn't turn to my parents for help either. Instead of finding someone to help me, I was screamed at and hit for not knowing English. They bought these cards with names of colors and shapes. I was put in the ground while they sat on the couch looking down at me. I was hit if I couldn't pronounce the names, and I honestly hated the entire experience. Eventually, I did learn how to swim. I say thanks to Sesame Street and all the PBS programs. Without them, it would have taken longer to learn English. Another experience was how to ride a bike. I didn't learn until I was 13, once again by myself. When I was 7, they took me out to teach me. I fell once and boom, my dad started screaming at me how useless and dumb I was. My mom didn't say anything. My parents didn't even help me up. My dad left and my mom said to stop crying and go back to the house. It was my first time on a bike. I don't know what he expected from me. When my sister was born, I decided to teach her English and how to properly ride a bike, plus other things. I didn't want her to go through what I went through. When riding a bike, I always saw parents holding on to their kids and then letting them go, helping them up and encouraging them to try again when they fell. My dad isn't one of those people, so I knew I couldn't count on him to teach my sister. Proud to say, I taught her how to ride a bike. Story 81 I had fallen into a neighbor's swimming pool as a four-year-old and lost consciousness as I sank. Luckily, the lady of the house saw it happen shortly after and rescued, then resuscitated me. This was 45 years ago when it was common to let your kids wander at large and before pool fencing became a legal requirement in my state. I was left with a righteous fear of water, but still my parents didn't do much to make sure I learned to swim or overcome my fear. We owned a speedboat my family would take out every weekend of summer, and all the kids wore life jackets. My siblings happily learned to ski and kneeboard, and I was okay with sitting as far away from the site as possible, as I knew my father would otherwise force me to have a go. I'd sit in the tube and be pulled along, but anything else brought me to silent, white-faced panic. This drove my father crazy. He was a huge, muscular man, a bully and often violent, and should never have been around children. He couldn't handle having a weak child, so one day he literally hauled me up by the top of my life jacket. I was a skinny little seven-year-old and threw me out into the water, maybe ten meters away. No one was allowed to help me get back into the boat, and adding to my struggles, I was wearing an adult-sized jacket, so it was lifting up and I was sliding out of it at the deepest part of the river. It was common lore that if you sank under the water, they wouldn't be able to find your body because the water was so brown. Usually, drownings were found days later, trapped downstream in reeds. I was nearly hysterical, but somehow made my way back fighting the current, the jacket, and my inability to swim. Needless to say, I never overcame my fear, and even as a nearly 50-year-old, I have an unsettledness, even in bathwater, over my chest. Story 82 When I was 16, my mother got me a job after school at her place of work. One day, I was trying to sit through a boring meeting when I started to feel sick. I got really shaky, dizzy, and my vision started to blur. I got up to excuse myself from the meeting and immediately collapsed on the floor. The last thing I remember before going unconscious was hearing one of my coworkers say, Oh my god, Milgnortz is dead. I woke in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. My blood sugar was tested by the paramedic and it was at 23 mg to dl, which is hyperglycemic and could lead to death. I was given something, I don't remember what, because I was still in mental fog, but started to feel better when I got to the ER. I spent the next eight hours at the hospital undergoing a ton of different tests. During all of this, my mother was nowhere to be found. This was before cell phones were common, so I couldn't give her a call. When it was time for me to be discharged, I had one of the nurses call my house to see if anyone knew where she was, and sure enough, my mother picked up the phone. She was embarrassed that I had made a scene at work and told me to find my own way home. Luckily, I had some cash in my wallet and was able to take a cab. When I got home, the only thing she said to me was, that will teach you. The lesson I learned that day was that if I'm going to nearly die, do it in private so as not to embarrass anyone. Story 83. My father is an avid outdoorsman, and for one spring break, we went on my very first ice climbing trip. Now, to be truthful, I do like ice climbing now, but you wouldn't know it back then. We were on a very basic beginner run that was literally right next to the highway, as in be driving on the road and there was a large cleared area clearly for parking. Anyways, I was quite nervous and unsure as to what to do. We hadn't done any practice prior to the trip, and I hadn't even put any crampons on before this. So here I am, maybe like 20 feet in the air, calves arching because I don't understand the concept of letting my toes support my full weight. 
All the while, my ungloved hands feel like they're on fire from the cold. I can't make it. I rappel down, holding back tears. I tell my dad how cold my hands are, and my dad says, Well, just go warm your hands up in the car then. Which I do, but as soon as I get in the car, I finally break down and bawl out, literally screaming in the car with how bad my hands hurt. Not paying attention, I'm surprised when my dad opens the door and says, What the hell are you doing in here? What's all this noise? Trying to save face, I just tell him how bad my hands were hurting and that I wasn't aware of how loud I was. He tells me that I need to calm down and that I need to try again. If I don't, then it means I'll never get the courage to do it. So after about 10 minutes, my hands finally start to get some feeling back. And honestly, I was so mad at the situation that I slap my gear back on and then, and I can only describe it like this, I proceed to hate climb my way to the top. See, that wasn't so bad, was it? You did that way faster than last time. Cut to me at various points in my life. Yeah, for some reason my hands will sometimes just get unbelievably hot. Like it feels like they're on fire or covered in needles. And moments like this is where I'll find some cold metal to grab. It usually was the metal legs to my school desk. I have no idea if those things are related, but I do have a very distinct memory as an adult going over my hand pain to my mom and her being apparently unaware of it all these years. To which my dad replied from the other room, Oh, you've always had that, ever since you were a kid. Story 84. Said I was going to run away if Dad didn't come home. Mom said, fine, do it. So I left. Got down the street before some awesome ladies brought me home. Mom was pissed. Guess she didn't hear me go out the door. I was five. I effing hate the sensation of needing to urinate. Always have. So I go pee at every opportunity. When I was a kid, I had a hard time holding my bladder because of it. I was in class, went to the bathroom once already, had to go again. Teacher refused. I pissed myself. Embarrassing. I think I was like seven. I also hated ground beef as a kid. Refused to eat it. I don't eat meat anymore, but ground beef has always been disgusting to me. So mom makes burgers anyway. I won't eat it. They forced me to sit at the table for hours and wouldn't let me get up until I ate it. My child brain tried to compromise by eating everything but the burger, but it wasn't good enough. They gave up, whipped my ass with a belt, and sent me to bed. There are several others. My parents weren't the greatest. The worst was after high school. I was staying with my girlfriend for a few days in another city. She was roommates with my brother and other friend from their college. My brother went home to visit. When he came back, he had all my crap. My mom kicked me out without saying anything and made him bring my stuff. Definitely made me feel like a burden to everyone around me. Story 85. 18 year old me was learning to race sailboats with my grandpa and a few of his teammates. We just had a conversation about what to do if someone goes overboard and the absolute danger of jellyfish, which I found fascinating because they aren't a thing I'd ever thought of as dangerous. Me. Wow, can someone really die by swimming or falling in a jellyfish? Grandpappy's crew. Yep, and if it happens, you're supposed... Grandpa. Sparta kicks me off the side of the boat, cackling like a madman, clearly amused. I could hear him laughing all the way down, and things went kind of slow-mo. On the way down, I catch just a glimpse of it to my left. Literal feet from where I dropped into the water. A patch of effing jellyfish near the surface. A lot of them. They were a lot bigger than I'd always thought they'd be. They swing the boat back around. I climb back on deck, and a few of the guys had looks of absolute horror when they saw how close I was to what we just talked about. Grandpa, still amused, hands me a beer, and we carry on like all's well. Story 86. Until I was about 14, I was incredibly afraid of the dark and being alone. I always had to sleep in the same room as everyone else or I would have horrific panic attacks, screaming, hyperventilating, crying, feeling like I was about to die, and that something was coming for me, that type of thing. My dad would get angry at me all the time if I woke him up and would start yelling, which scared me even more, often causing me to cry in my bed until I fell asleep, or beg my brother until he let me sleep in his room on the floor. It was this hell of being afraid of either what my dad would do if I woke him up again, or what would happen if whatever I was afraid of caught me. My dad always said things like, you need to learn to sleep by yourself. You're age now. Grow up. I still get a little scared when I'm alone at night, but I don't get as bad anymore and I can sleep alone without being afraid. I know, it sounds stupid, but I legitimately thought I was going to die in some horrific way if I was alone at night or in the shower. Basically, anywhere my vision is obscured and no one could help me. Story 87. As a child in the late 70s slash early 80s, my mom refused to have myself and my sister vaccinated, which was weird as she was a nurse and my dad was a doctor. 
My dad really wanted us vaccinated, but as usual, mum won the argument. So me and my sister both got measles when I was around five. I caught pneumonia and subsequently developed serious asthma after that. I still remember the all-consuming pain of the measles nearly 40 years later. I felt like I was dying for a long time. My dad says it was touch and go for a while as we both had a really bad case of it. And the asthma I then developed really inhibited the rest of my childhood. Pisses me off so much when I hear that people won't vaccinate their kids. Even if vaccinations did cause autism, which they absolutely do not, what's worse, autism or potential death? Messed up logic. People all over the world have varying levels of autism and are just fine. Of course, even now, my mother won't admit she was wrong not to vaccinate us. She was apparently just following medical advice at the time. Story 88. My great uncle had a dog that was an extremely aggressive Rottweiler mix. It absolutely hated kids and had attacked several before. This was early 90s. I still don't know how the dog wasn't euthanized. He only barely tolerated most adults and had given two men stitches. My uncle swore up and down that the dog had saved his life and would never have put it down. For whatever reason, he insisted on bringing it down to the family visits at his dad's, my great-grandpa's house, and leaving it in the backyard while the kids played in the front. I was getting good at climbing trees, encouraged to climb by my dad, but I wasn't confident about coming down. It was okay, though. I was enjoying jumping into my daddy's arms. I didn't often get one-on-one time with him or my mother, divorced, and it was really special to me. I used to believe my dad was a prince. I was maybe six? Anyway, my dad never told me to stop climbing up if I needed help down. Honestly, he was encouraging me to climb, so I thought we were playing a game. Then, all of a sudden, when I'm up in a tree and ready to jump to him, he just gets stone-faced and walks away. He says, figure out how to get down on your own. He walked away, and I was there for maybe 45 minutes, sobbing. Then my uncle says, hey, let me show you the dog. At this point, I'm sure they've forgotten me in the tree. They unlatch the gate and let the dog out, who instantly goes to the tree and starts growling slash jumping for my ankles. I'm screaming. My great uncle, grandpa, and dad just talk about the dog like he's some prize horse, totally ignoring me. Look at him jump. Got good legs. After maybe an hour, at this point I'm holding desperately to the tree and nearly losing my grip because I've tried to climb higher, away from the dog, they put the dog away. Great, Dad will surely get me down now. Nope, they all went back inside. Maybe 15 minutes later, my stepmom comes rushing out. She wordlessly takes me down from the tree. I remember her shaking and thinking she was cold. Now I understand it was pure rage. This is mean, this is cruel. Listen, I'm all for kind of having your children learn through application, trial and error, instead of you just telling them they have to figure things out. But again, this is another case of like scaring, terrifying, traumatizing your child. And for what? For what? How often is she going to need to know the skill of how to dismount from a tree? Like, come on. I think that some parents, unfortunately, use their children as, like, a form of catharsis to be, you know, like, these test experiments, and they kind of get thrills out of horrifying their children. Not cool, and I hope that mom ripped dad a new one after getting the daughter down. Story 89. We're playing late, but I'm just now seeing this. I really appreciate that OP is participating. That doesn't happen that often. Anyway, I'm a lady and was taught a lot of homemaking skills while growing up. I started helping in the kitchen at four, then learned sewing, ironing, cleaning, etc. Unlike my family, I also have a mechanical mind and figured out how to fix a lot of things before learning how to make slash build my own things, pre-internet. I've been the handyman since I was about 14, but I was never taught money management. I moved out at 21 and got married shortly thereafter, and then divorced, and became fantastic at effing myself over financially in a myriad of ways. I'm now 50-ish and just getting my crap together financially. I have a credit card again, and pay it off every month. My longtime partner and I are buying a house. And all I have now is disability income, but I can manage my expenses just fine, as well as help out my elderly mother. I had to figure out money management all by myself, and I definitely don't have a head for numbers. Story 90. I worked with pregnant and parenting teens many years ago. A new girl joined our program. She was barely 13 and on her second pregnancy. The first one was an abortion. Her mother, and I use that term loosely, refused to allow her to get another abortion or go on birth control after the first one because, quote, she made her bed and she needs to lie in it. And she didn't learn from the first one, so maybe she'll learn from this one. Yeah. 
That mom struggled 100 times more than any other teen mom participant. The baby was left with basically anyone who showed the least bit of interest. Like, said, oh, your baby's so cute. Friends, family members, sometimes almost total strangers. We had events for moms that naturally included their babies, and the baby was often dirty, unbathed in dirty clothing with an old nasty diaper, and starved for attention. Never enough for child services to actually remove the baby from the home. As the baby became a toddler, unsurprisingly, she had significant behavioral issues with the child and often said it was because her child was just a bad kid. The mom eventually ended up in prison as an adult, along with her younger sister. Not sure what happened to the baby. As I moved on to another position before the baby reached preschool age. So, many of the teen mothers in that program came from neglectful or abusive homes, with parents who had little or no clue how to constructively parent a child. And so the cycle often repeated itself. Very few of the teen moms had someone who supported or encouraged them as people, let alone as moms. There were a few who were attentive and loving mothers with their children, but they were the exception rather than the rule. Yes, they loved their children, but that's different than being a loving mother. Story 92. I have a few. When I was about 11 or 12, I dislocated my knee for the first time at home with my siblings and my dad. I was screaming in pain and my brothers were freaking out seeing it. I ended up pushing the kneecap back into place and my dad refused to take me to the doctor because I was fine now and made me walk inside and wait for my mother to get home and deal with me. I had to walk from the paddock all the way to the back of the house with a freshly dislocated knee and with no help from him at all as he said I was fine and needed to get over it. I also used to get this debilitating pain in my back that would radiate around my abdomen so bad I could hardly breathe. I used to lie on the ground and try to stretch my back to stop the pain, but it was and still is the worst thing I've ever experienced. Each time I had a flare-up, Dad would tell me to get over it while I was moaning and trying to breathe on the floor. His lack of empathy and refusal to help me with my pain and my subsequent knee dislocations is one of the main reasons I don't have a relationship with him now. He was the same way with my brother, who ended up needing kidney surgery because his pain was ignored for too long, and he was told to just get over it. Basically, if he couldn't see anything wrong with you, then there was nothing wrong with you, even if you were crying out on the floor in pain. The absolute worst parenting style ever. Story 93. My mom was always, logical consequence for your poor decision making, but also, don't bother me unless you're bleeding. She wanted to make sure we were ready for the real world and all. Well, one summer, when I was 13, I got lice. I knew it was lice because bugs shouldn't be crawling out of your scalp and your head shouldn't itch that much. I told my mother for three weeks that I had lice. She kept waving me off and calling me overdramatic. I finally got so pissed I got the family computer, printed out a picture of lice, took it to her, pulled one of those effers off my scalp and put it next to the picture for a comparison. They had grown large enough at this point to be able to see easily. My logical consequence for correcting identifying lice? A shaved head because two lice killing kits were too expensive, and being quarantined in my room for a week while my family fumigated the house. I still got in trouble for them not taking me seriously. As a soon-to-be adult, you need to make your kids know. Same with my broken arm. Same when I was getting bullied. Same with the asthma. My parents were big of giving us our independence and letting us solve our own problems, but without giving us the resources to actually be independent. Story 94. When I was four, my mom was a SAHM, and she had a total mental breakdown. Despite this, no one made any effort to put me somewhere else, and my dad kept working as usual. My mom would take two to three hour naps, during which I was meant to feed and entertain myself, though I wasn't allowed the TV because the noise might wake her, and I was too young to read. To keep from waking her up, because she always woke up enraged that I disturbed her, I took to playing outside by myself instead. There were no other kids in our neighborhood, just a couple of older men, and I wasn't allowed to cross the street and visit the married couple who would let me play with their dogs. Eventually, one of the older men in the neighborhood noticed that I was outside alone every afternoon for hours and started coming over. He was friends with my dad, not a stranger. He essayed me. It went on every day for weeks until he managed to keep me out of sight slash yelling distance long enough for my mom to wake up and realize I was missing. But the only thing that changed was I wasn't allowed to play outside anymore. Story 95. Actually, my boyfriend has a story. It wasn't parenting. It was for a job. 
So at our old job, the freezer department head was a no-show slash no-call for one day. So the boss decided to fire him and said, Hey John, want to be department head? Not his real name. And since he was the only one aside from the old apartment head, he had no choice but to go for it. There was no help, he asked to be trained, and boss decided to quickly show him how to deal with throwaways, and that was it. He was on his own. He legit asked, is this my entire training? And she said, yep. Incoming inventory, he had never dealt with inventory before and asked for help. Boss lady said he already knew what to do, even though he admitted that he had never done it before. Day after inventory, boss was pissed yelled at him for doing such a terrible job. He straight up said, I told you, I've never done inventory before. John here says that the look on her face went from furious to calm so fast it was scary. She simply said, oh, so it's my fault, and walked away. This wasn't even the only instance. She constantly yelled and ridiculed John for not doing his job correctly, even though he had no training whatsoever. Eventually, he quit and got a job that paid him better. Recently, we had learned that she had paid $12 an hour for John to lead a large-ass department, but was paying his friend, who was in Delhi, about 16 an hour, which the Delhi was half the size of the freezer. She had some serious favoritism going on. Story 96. I used to work for a max security mental hospital on the juvenile unit. One teen we had lived exactly through what the title says, more or less. His father was an abusive POS, and when he'd get mad, he would beat his son senseless, but sometimes would bring them out on the lake behind their house, throw the boys out in the middle of the lake, and go back home in his boat. The sons could have died. They were, are, obese and out of shape. The younger one had, has, had anger management issues. It would take at least eight people to keep him down when he needed to be injective with a sedative. The older one also had, has, anger management issues, but he got caught as an adult, so went to prison, then was sent to my hospital because he was acting out all the time. Last time I saw the older brother, he told me the other was now in jail. Honestly, the younger bro, we had him for almost two years on the teen unit, and he's one of the worst, hardest kids we ever got, in my opinion. His childhood was so effed up, and now he's an adult with the emotional intelligence of a two-year-old. Anxiety through the roof, severe personality disorder, self-harm tendencies, intermittent explosive disorder, and more. Little to no schooling, can barely read or write, such bad case. Story 97. My parents sheltered me and protected me from a lot of the reality of life growing up. They gave me an amazing childhood that I took for granted because of it. Then again, if it hadn't been for that childhood, I likely wouldn't be here today. I graduated high school and they decided for me that I wouldn't go to any of the universities I'd applied and been accepted to. Instead, I'd go to community college with impacted classes and pay for it by getting two part-time jobs. Wouldn't have been a bad plan if the classes weren't impacted because everyone was doing it. I couldn't get classes and they got upset I wasn't going to school. So, in a fit of insanity and youthful ignorance, I joined the Marine Corps. If this wasn't bad enough, I got talked into the reserve. If I ever see my recruiter again, I'll go to prison smiling. A reservist gets all the expectation and pressure of serving, without the pay, the training, or the benefits. We're still expected to do the same job, though, and if you humble effort, you get the same punishments. Anyway, after basic, MCT, and A and C school, which isn't nearly enough to get you up to speed and working on whatever you need to work on, they send you home. I get home. Everything's great, right? No. Turns out I still can't get a decent job. End up doing the same old security crap I'd always done making minimum wage and losing sleep. To make matters worse, I lose three shifts a month to make $150 driving 180 plus miles to Camp Pendleton. I tried to get on to school only to find out that even though I was accepted to college, my CO wouldn't sign off on transfer orders for another unit. So I could attend. Not that it mattered because the GI Bill you get as a reservist only covers $300 a year to go to school. It was right about then my parents sold the house and left me without a place to live. So now I was serving the country but homeless, living out of my crappy CRV and making minimum wage at a part-time job. Nearly ended myself it got so bad. Ended up selling gear so I could survive. Sold my blues a few weeks before the ball because I needed the money and it was a hot item. I could afford haircuts and would show up overgrown and nasty. 
The only uniform I could afford were the ones that I'd been given at boot camp, and they barely held themselves together after boot, let alone six more years of service I had to give. I won't even talk about the hazing. It happened a lot, but that's honestly not what affected me the worst. It was the full-on screaming matches my NCOs would have because they just couldn't understand the level of hardship I was going through. I got so used to being chewed up and spit out, I would just break down and either get angry and belligerent or just go numb and zone out. I was always looking over my shoulder constantly alert because I knew at any minute someone would pull me to the side and tear into me for something I couldn't control and could no longer even attempt to voice reason for. The psych I still see was convinced I saw combat from the level PTSD, anxiety, and depression I showed when I started seeing him. Six years of that. The moment they said I could, I stripped and ran. I didn't even collect my DD-215, reserve variant of the DD-214. It's been two years since I was officially released, my first year and quarter. I had legitimate delusions and was terrified of everyone. Now I'm doing a bit better. I managed to get a job working in aviation, sort of secretary work, and I've moved on from there, continuing that line of work. I do better when I can communicate through text. I don't do well talking to people in person. I tear up randomly and start to shake, especially in groups. Don't join the military, folks, and if you have to, whatever you do, don't join the reserve. Parents, I know it's difficult to continue supporting a grown child, because that's what you are at 18, to around your mid-20s, despite what they think. But I've talked to my dad about it a few times, and he's confided in me his biggest regret in life was not sending me to college when I got accepted. He saw firsthand a lot of what I went through, and the results he would offer help when he could, but he couldn't support me because of my uncle, I assume, but that's another story. I don't personally blame him or my mother despite her attitude towards me. Could I have made better choices? Probably. But I couldn't see a lot of them, and by the time I realized the mistakes I'd made, it was far too late. I'm so effing tired, guys. Story 98. It's not my story, but it's someone's I was close to once. When she was younger, her dad and her uncles did this sort of thing constantly in really abusive and traumatic ways for her. I remember two of the stories specifically. One of them was literally throwing her in the pool to make her learn how to swim. Except they didn't just throw her in, they actually started to drown her, pushing her under the water and holding her there until they decided she needed air. And they did that continuously until they thought she learned how to swim well enough. The other one that sticks with me involved them trying to get her over her intense fear of bugs. They grabbed her, threw her into an anthill, and forced her to stay there until they decided she could go. The anthill broke and the ants began crawling all over her entire body, which was one of the biggest things she was scared of with her phobia. As a result, her fear of bugs just became that much more intense. Those stories, those traumas, along with tons and tons of others, many of them much worse, contributed to her being very mentally not okay. She didn't let it make her a bad person. I'm really happy to say she's doing a whole lot better now, and I'm really proud of how far she's come from all that. Story 99. Well, my mother is a narcissist who struggles with empathy, and my father had no father, and his mother abandoned him at 16 or 17. So they meant well, but neither of them really understood how to teach me anything. Sometimes they would get it right, and I've got plenty of good memories of them teaching me things the right way. But there's also plenty of things I still don't understand how to do, as I was just told to figure it out. So I tend to have funny holes in my understanding of things that don't make much sense. My parents taught me all about sex, with boys and girls, in detail, and I'm very comfortable and confident sexually now. But not a word about dating, love, talking to people, what's expected of me in a relationship, or even how to take a compliment. I have a super active sex life, and in the circles I hang out in, people seem to find me pretty attractive. But to this day, I've never so much as been on a date. And if you compliment me on the littlest thing, I turn red as a tomato and laugh nervously until I remember how to talk. Luckily, plenty of people find that to be really cute, but I hate it so much. When my mom gave me the talk about drugs, she made sure I knew, realistically, without any extra fear-mongering, what the safe drugs and the dangerous drugs were, and that even good drugs like weed or LSD can be very dangerous if you use them wrong. She tried her best to tell me how everything she'd ever tried was supposed to feel, so I knew what to expect and when to be concerned told me how to get rid of the spins and when to just go make myself vomit. She explained strains of weed and that I should avoid synthetic weed. 
everything, and I'm so glad I know all that stuff. But now when I smoke with her, and I don't know how to hit a bong, pack a bowl, or how to portion out much, it's okay for me to smoke, which is very important. She just says things like, just pull it, or just take a couple hits. My mom had me hit a effing massive homemade gravity bong my first couple times I asked to smoke with her, and it took me a long time and a lot of vomiting to realize that that is just way too much weed for me. It took me three days to figure out I was smoking a joint wrong, and by that time I'd smoked half of it. My dad has been a professional truck driver for over 20 years. He paints the lines on the road, and he's very good at what he does. He's taught other people how to drive before. He has a perfect driving record, and the one accident he's ever been in, which was not his fault, didn't even involve another driver. My mother also has a perfect driving record, but she's been hit by multiple drunk drivers, killed her first new car by never once having the oil changed, and instead of just buying another car, she paid $9,000 of my dad's money to replace the entire engine. She's a scared driver with absolutely no car knowledge beyond how to actually drive. Take a wild guess who taught me how to drive. I'm a pretty good driver now, but that mostly is because I spent five months working with my dad and watching him drive. Before that, I was super anxious being behind the wheel. And I almost got in several accidents because my mom couldn't help but distract me at the wheel to complain about my driving. 